Wait, wait. We are live now. Uh, we shall be recording the entire proceedings and it will be available in the YouTube and the Indian Arthroplasty Association channel for people to see later. So I need your kind permission for that. Another four minutes to go. Sorry? I'm not sure who will want to see me, but that's fine. <laughs> no, no, not many people. I, you'll be later. surprised, uh, Dr. Chun. There'll be many afterwards. The many see, you know, uh, we have seen people, 3,000, 4,000 people are, you know, going to YouTube later. There's on. a lot of webinars go together on Saturday. So they actually go back and they look later. India is one of the best countries for this. Every time we organize a meeting for the APOA, the largest number of participants all come from India and always ask questions. And I, I love it. I just love it. <laughs> I, I really don't like talking to a wall. Too many people. It's Indo-Malaysia bonding. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the Dr. Chun, all of us are aging and getting old. Dr. Chun looks younger and younger. I don't know what he takes. <laughs> See? Well, he's not telling you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know what it is. I, I, I guess... Since stopping at the university six years ago, my life is a lot easier. I used to I used to work till like past midnight, three nights a week, and it's terrible. And when I was not doing that, I was traveling all the time. It's like mm -hmm. just not great. I still travel all the time, but it's it's at least it's tolerable. So so you are doing practice now, practicing now? Yeah. Well, barely is the word. Actually, we we've barely done anything for for a year. More than well, almost a year plus, a year one month. Okay. We were locked down last year in April and we intermittently opened and closed and opened and closed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. And, and what is there a wage uh, for retirement in Malaysia? Um, the age of your retirement from government is 55. Oh, I see. At which point you can collect your pension, which is pretty good. <laughs> so they kept trying to persuade me to extend. My, my stay with the government and I said, Are you, do you think I'm stupid or something? <laughs> I know. <laughs> you have two minutes to go. So I'll start sharing this, my screen at 6.29. Yes, sir. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, dear friends. Good afternoon to the friends from United Kingdom. Greetings from Indian Orthoplasty <laughs> Association and uh, welcome to the IAA 360 degree webinar series. I am Subran Sumanti, the current president of Indian Orthoplasty Association. We started in 1995 and completed 25 years last year. Hence, we celebrated our Silver Jubilee year 
under the shadow of pandemic. We started with series of webinars and this is a webinar which is devoted to cemented hip replacement. You can know more about our association from www.indianarthroplastyassociation.com and offer your suggestions at this email ID, indianarthroplasty at gmail.com or to my personal email ID, Dr. Ashish Mahanti at hotmail.com. We have two WhatsApp group of life members, IA1 and IA2. If you are a life member and not a member of this group, then please send me a message 9869794189 and I'll include you in the group. Dear friends, with a heavy heart and gives me immense pain to convey you that one of our very senior orthoplasty surgeon and a life member of Indian Orthoplasty Association, Dr. Sekhar Agrawal, is no more. We lost him a couple of days back on 10th May, fighting for COVID-19. Dr. Sekhar Agrawal was the chief surgeon of Delhi Institute of Trauma and Orthopedics. He was the vice president and executive director of Sant Parmanand Hospital at New Delhi. He was an eminent teacher and awarded Dr. B. C. Roy National Award in 2018 for being an eminent teacher. He achieved Lifetime Achievement Award by National Healthcare Leadership in 2019. He was a visiting professor at the prestigious Tamil Nadu Dr. MGR Medical University. And as we know, he was the first president of Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons in which he was a founding member as well as a trustee. We lost a great friend, a very senior colleague and a gentle human being and a humble human being. Friends, I request all of you to pray in silence for one minute for this noble soul starting from now. Thank you. On behalf of Indian Orthoplasty Association, we'll send a message of condolence to the bereaved family from the Secretariat. Thank you very much. Friends, this is the 16th webinar of uh, Indian Orthoplasty Association, which is devoted totally to cemented total hip orthoplasty back to future. We conduct our webinars on the third Saturday evening of every month. Today, the convener is Dr. Smarajit Patnaik, who is a senior consultant at Apollo Hospital, Bhuvaneshwar, and a senior national board teacher of uh, you know, DNB. Let me introduce our guest speakers today. Our first speaker is Mr. Bodo Parvak, who is a consultant of orthopedic surgeon at Wrightington Hospital. Bodo graduated from Germany in 1991, completed his basic surgical training in Switzerland from 92 to 93. Then he completed a residency program at the Woodpark University in 1995. He underwent specialist training at the prestigious Auschwitz rotation from 95 to 96, and then at Wrightington from 97 to 2000. And since 2000, he has been a consultant at Wrightington Hospital. And when I was a fellow there in 2000, Bodo was instrumental in taking me through each and every strip of you know, cemented hip, what he imbibed from you know, John Chanley and Professor Robleski. I am really grateful to Bodo for 
you know, teaching me and getting matured in the art of cementing the hip. His academic and research interests include blood salvaging methods, joint rubrication models, bone graft substitute, and foremost, the continuous study of long-term behavior of artificial joint. Bodo, thank you very much for joining us today. Professor Peter K is not unknown to the Indian orthoplasty surgeons. He has visited India many times in the past. He's a consultant orthopedic surgeon at Wrightington Hospital, the honorary clinical professor of University of Central Lancashire, an honorary professor in orthopedics at the University of Manchester. He was the past president of the British Orthopedic Association, as well as the past president of British Hip Society. And he has been active during his trainees days being the president of British Orthopedic Trainees Association as well. Peter was the National Clinical Director for Musculoskeletal Services of NHS England from 2013 till 2019. At present, he's a fellow and elected council member of Royal College of Surgeons of England and Council of the Medical Defense Union. Thank you, Peter, for joining today. He has been my mentor during my training during the writing turn, and I have learned and I developed an interest towards the infection in joint replacement under Peter's guidance, and we published a paper after my fellowship as well. Thank you, Peter, for joining today. Another stalwart in the world of cemented hip orthoplasty, Mr. Matthew Hubble, who is a consultant trauma and orthopedic surgeon in the Exeter Hip Unit at Princess Elizabeth Orthopedic Center and the Royal Devon and Exeter NHS Foundation Trust. You know, Matthew specializes in hip and knee surgery, including primary and revision joint replacement and arthroscopy as well. Thanks, Matt, for joining today. And he will be delivering a unique lecture that how to plan a cemented hip today, which probably I'll be hearing for the first time from any of the you know, hip surgeons. Thanks, Matt, for joining today. Now, Professor John Timperley, he has, he's not unknown to Indian crowd as well. He's a consultant orthopedic surgeon specializing in hip surgery. He's honorary professor at College of Engineering, Mathematics and Physical Science at University of Exeter. He was the first president of British Hip Society as well and served on the executive of British Orthopedic Association. He was awarded a PhD degree in the University of Oxford as well. John has been associated with the development and practice of Exeter hip surgery right from its inception along with other surgeons like Ravin Ling and all. Thank you, Professor Timperley, for joining us today. We have Professor David S.K. Chun today with us from Malaysia. He was the professor of the University of Malaya Medical Center, past president of Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association, and past president of Malayan Orthopedic Association as well. And he was the past president of Computer Assisted Orthopedic Surgery, Asia Pacific, and past chairman of HIP section of the APOA as well. Thank you, Professor Chun, joining today. And we'll be knowing from you that whether all the cemented HIPs are same. Thank you, and welcome to this webinar. Last but not the least, our own Professor Jawahar Pachore. And each and every orthoplasty surgeon in India knows him. He is the director of Department of Hip Replacement Surgery at Salvi Hospital, Ahmedabad. He was the founder president of Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons and secretary general of Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons as well. Dr. Pachare has been instrumental in starting the joint registry in this country, which is known as ISC registry, and is continuing with it with all his efforts. He is an internationally acclaimed hip replacement surgeon. His contributions in the field of orthopedics and total hip replacement is par excellence for the last more than 40 to 50 years. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. And he is my mentor right from the days when I started the hip surgery. And until now, he has been mentoring me. And what I am today is because of him only. Thank you, sir, for joining today. Besides our Guest speakers, we have Dr. KT Rajshekhar from Bangalore, Dr. Kezar Reddy from Hyderabad, Dr. Rakesh Rasput from Kolkata, Dr. Deepak Gautam from Delhi, Dr. K. Kalai Vanan from Chennai, who will be also sharing their experience with the cemented hips. Now, there is a disclaimer that there is a stringent patient privacy laws. I request all the speakers 
to protect the privacy of the patient, the slide or videos, whatever they are showing. And uh, friends, this is a digital online platform. They, if there is any inadvertent technical failure, please bear with us. Now, without wasting any time, I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Patnaik to start with the you know, webinar. Over to Dr. Smarajit Patnaik, please. Good evening, uh, all the distinguished uh, faculties. To Dr. Chun. So we let's start away with the uh, program. And this is a long waited program on uh, cemented hip uh, arthroplasty. So the theme has been like back to future. And we start off with uh, the introductory lecture on none other than Professor John Chandley by Mr. Bodo Purvak. So let's uh, right away go to business. Thank you. Thank you. I invite Dr. Bodo to come and have his uh, lecture. Bodo, you have to unmute yourself. Unmute. Shubhranshu, thank you very much for that invite. It takes me back to the past and into the future. I don't feel that old after, well, after all seeing you today. This is my first webinar. I feel a bit uncomfortable. I hope I'm going to get it right. It's a very great privilege to share that with you. I have been to Bangalore, not yet to Mumbai, and I would wish actually we were here together and we'd go out for a good meal afterwards anyway. Just to get to the point of it, back to the future was almost a thought for me, except that I live in the past. But the past has a future built in, and that's what I would like to share with you today. The original presentation was meant to be pioneer and genius. Now think, actually, what I want to point out is that this type of surgery is only just about 60 years old. We haven't reached 60 decades, six decades yet from the start of this operation here at Wrightington. And it's good to see some souls that have learned it here at Wrightington and taken it on and making it better. John Chani, let me just see why my computer is not. Not yet. I can't, sorry. John Chani had lived in the early part of the last century and had connections to the real beginning of the orthopedic world from Robert Jones to Harry Platt, of course, to Oswestry and everything else. And that's what I'd like to share with you today to see how important it is not to find the next new solution or to look for the next new material, but to find some other small aspect of something, but to look at the whole picture and say, what have we learned and how have we learned it? And you can see Wrightington was opened just about about 10 years later than Oswestry Street by, of course, the eminent Sir Robert Jones, because, of course, he had an interest to make orthopedics grow as a place of special interest and special treatment. And, of course, Robert Jones had a pupil or a disciple similar to us. Harry Platt learned from Robert Jones, and that is actually the almost the generational consequences of teaching and learning. Robert Jones, Harry Platt, John Charney. And you can see Sir Harry Platt opening the bioengineering lab that no longer is, unfortunately, because we want to do away with the past. And of course, John Charney put something together that is really one of the major operations of the last century that almost, you know, un un unfortunately not recognized for its effect. John Charney should have had a Nobel Prize for this type of procedure that allowed so many patients to live continuously without pain and to have such a good outcome from it for such a long period of time. He wasn't ever recognized for it. And I think we're still struggling today to understand what John Chani put into the world and how successful he was. And rather than trying to find the, the next new thing, we ought to focus on what he's got right and then see whether we can take it much further than that. We all have seen these cases, desperate patients with multiple previous operations, you can see half her iliac wing is missing. And that looks fairly much a straightforward type of charney hip replacement done well. You can see actually this goes back to the very early days because the trochanter sits on the side of the trochanter. This is position one for the trochanter. John Charney was very consequential in the way how he went about finding a solution to the problem of replacing the joint. And the logical consequence was, of course, to try human materials 
to see whether you can replace parts of that joint to make it work. That was the first real resurfacing operation. And what you figured out was not what happens in the bearing, but what happens between the materials, between the bearing and the living bone. That's the crucial part. And therefore he said, resurfacing isn't going to work well. We need to find a different solution. You can see, this is actually a very concise history of a young patient desperately suffering with hip pain and what solutions can be found. And as much as the resurfacing operations did not help particularly well for a long period of time, they gave these patients immense pain relief though. So they were actually still a welcome solution even though they weren't a lasting solution. John Charney went on from finding that resurfacing wasn't a solution to find a solution that he went on to defining the head and socket size and the relationship between it. So it's not a choice to say, we'll go with a 28 or a 32 or a 24 or a 22 millimeter head. It was actually well calculated and well researched to find that the best solution that he could offer is a 22 millimeter head and a 42 or 44 socket, which gave us a one to two ratio. And what he achieved with that is actually decoupling the forces in the bearing to allow the forces acting on the fixation of the bearing to become reduced. That is the transition uh, from looking for materials to actually design concept to say, how else can I achieve what mother nature does with the wonderful material of cartilage and bone that we have not at our disposal. And that marks the genius in John Charney. Mike Robleski, our teacher, two branches and mine and Peter Case and a lot of people, as others people, actually has understood this. And that's a kind of genius as well, to understand what has been achieved and to try and build on that. It's actually the change from finding materials to defining a technical design to allow fixation lasting for long periods of time. So Charney was not worried about that the sockets would wear. Charney was worried about how long the fixation and the transitional zone would last. And you can see part of that interest in research is also documentation and how forward looking was John Chani at the time when computers were not available. This is my first occasion for a webinar today. I feel almost primed actually. I'm sort of doing some, some, something super modern. Chani was super modern at the time when computers were not available. He documented everything with the punch card system that is the best automated system there, allowing actually a look into the future. And you can see, this is actually the first patient receiving an LFA that's printed on the side of it. The punch cards, of course, the IBM, IBM schedule of the eight holes, 864, 128, et cetera, et cetera. Charlie has that in his record keeping system already perspective to say, we are going to collect data on how these patients will function in the future. And you can see the patient did not turn up for annual visits for a few years because he did well. And you can see he kept on doing well for a long period of time. And this is a hip at 40 years. I started my lecture saying, we haven't reached 60 years of practice of the LFA, but we've seen patients go to 40 and even 50 years follow up. You can see the patients are deteriorating. The hips are holding well. Numbers of LFAs done here at writing, we're looking around about 40,000 in total. That's primary hips, 33,000 LFAs. You and I will have done a few, Shubrancho, and Mr. K as well. But when you look at the numbers with follow-up, you can see how that drip drops off because you won't have that many young patients. At writing, no, we have an opportunity to study how hips last over decades. And of course, when you look at 30, 40, or even 50 year follow up, when we've had one patient at 50 years who just died after her 50th year of LFAs, bilateral LFAs carried out in the 60s. And this is the perspective we tend to lose a bit. These are operations done in the middle of the last century, lasting the patient's almost entire adult life, certainly to their end. When you look at 40 years, these are 30, 20 to 30 year old patients that we have had the opportunity to study here at writing and see how well I've done. One of the hallmarks I think of an elegant and a successful solution is little change. And you can see how little has changed in the sucker design. The flange has come with it to make pressurization at the time of the operation easier, but ultimately there hasn't been much change. The same goes for the stem design. 
And you can see when Mike Robleski introduced us to CSTEM in the 1990s, we're looking at 30 years of practice and experience with the flat back uh, polished tapered stem. The VAC machine was not the consequence of changing anything. That was just an industrial process because it was too hard to machine and polish all the stems at the same time. So it was left to just polish the necks and the heads. So there is actually always this concept of a polished tapered stem sitting in, inside a cement mantle that allows movement as the patient go, gets about the, the, the loading the head. And when you look at the success story of the LFA, the first six years, had no revisions for mechanical problems. That's almost unrepeatable, I think. Nobody in the world will ever pull another study off where you do about 500 primary hips every year and have no mechanical problems. There are problems with infection and dislocation, but the first broken stem only appeared six years later. And you can see how the story develops over the years. And we know these problems. Broken stems with the first change in stem design, no longer an issue. Of course, loose components will turn up because, of course, components come to the end of their lifespan. But overall, actually almost an impressive success story that has, I don't think, little chance to be repeated. The first six, eight years, actually, you can see young patients under the age of 50 and it's courageous surgery. When in the inception of an operation, you dare to take young patients of that age to theater to replace their joints in and have the confidence that you give them pain relief and something that's lasting good enough. And you can see the first 240 patients under the age of 50 not requiring revision surgery for the first decade. Quite impressive. And you need to see 10 years out before you find the differences in the pattern of failure. An older rating out of 10 years is actually not enough. I'm afraid that is too young for most of my patients to say that's all you can achieve. An older rating of 20 years would be appreciated, but can see we no longer have the patience to sit this out. We always want the next new modern component, the next new material, the next new robot or something else. But it takes 10 to 12 years before you find the differences in the pattern. Dislocation and infection are not the big worry. Fractured stems will come up again a bit more. The C stem is, I think, also a bit more vulnerable than the Chinese stem was to fracture. Loose stems, loose, loose sockets, and loose femoral components are going to be what you see at the end of a lifespan because, of course, the skeleton changes, the load pattern changes. Activity levels do not depend on robots. Technology components, activity de de depends on patient's function and pain relief that we give them. And these are all patients that have had LFAs done at Wrightington. You can see it's actually daring. I wouldn't normally advise it, but it's nice to see that what patients can back up to. There's still scope for development, but you can see there is little that's left untouched, certainly in the hands of John Charney or Mike Robleski. This is actually done in the 80s. Mike Robleski started looking at crosslink polyethylene ceramic. That's in the 80s. We're looking at 25 to 30 years ago. There's actually little that's left unexplored in this type of surgery. There is a difference though, crosslink polyethylene and ceramic has done better, certainly in that series. So there is actually a hope that we can yet squeeze a few years extra out for patients. So after all, Chinese at 50 years of clinical success have given good outcomes. Patient selection is of course still critical and I'm slightly worried because we have seen such good success rates that we're offering that to too many young patients rather than trying to find other options to see whether we can keep them away from surgery for a little longer. And this is something that actually I find striking. What John Charney actually points out, as good as the operation is, first of all, you need to monitor what you're doing. You need to monitor yourself what you're doing. You mustn't pass it over to somebody else. You need want to know what the patients are happening. And of course, as much as pain relief is dramatic, and I've experienced it myself, and it's really, really an impressive operation to undergo. But you need to be careful what you're offering, and you also need to be prepared to look after them in the future. And you can see this in this particular patient. That is actually a daunting primary hip in anyone's hands. This was done in 1978. Looks like an easy hip, but Shabrancha and I, we both know actually this was only done because it was done to routine technique. And it's actually the technique that allows to do this so carefully. She came back to me 30 odd years later to say, what about the other hip, what you're going to do? And the answer is logical, the same, of course, 
Now, this is again a Chani hip, slightly different components, but in principle the same. My hip is not as comfortable as the left hip, let me tell you, and I hope it'll last her out to the end of her life. And it is actually that message that I want to pass over today. We progress not because we want to find the next new. We progress because we've learned something from our teachers in the past. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Great. You, uh, that was an excellent, you know, exposition. And uh, you, you really took us uh, back to the 60s and 70s. And uh, it was a feeling of nostalgia to visit the Wrightington, you know, that uh, with Brian, I was visiting the museum and uh, I'm sorry to know that it is no more there. But, uh, you know, uh, it was a great uh, that we heard this lecture and that gave us uh, all the you know, impetus to proceed further. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, let us invite, uh, you know, Peter, uh, you know, to talk about uh, will the cemented heap is back to the future that uh, we are moving back again to the cemented heap. Yes, Peter, would you like to share your screen? And you have to unmute yourself, Peter. Can yeah. you hear me now? Yeah. The, the system wasn't allowing me to unmute. Yeah, <laughs> we have to permit you. <laughs> you, you, you quieted me down. Well, thank you very much indeed. A great honor to, to yeah, be out. We, we are unable to see your screen. Excuse me. Uh, can you share your screen? Huh? Yeah. Can you close again and again share? Yeah, now it's visible, yeah. Can you see that? Yeah, just make a slide show, full screen. Uh, you're good, thanks. It's okay. Well, thank you very much. A great honor to be asked to, to speak. Great great to, to speak amongst friends as well. I know many of the, many of the faculty and uh, we've met many times and uh, our thoughts are with you in India at this time, obviously with the with the pandemic. I mean, we've it's a roller coaster. It's up and down, and we thought we were getting out of the, the difficult situation, but uh, we're having problems at the moment with our the, the neighbouring town of Bolton. Has the army deployed on the streets at the moment as we are fighting another local surgeon? So uh, we'll see how we get on. So cemented hip replacement, Back to the Future. Well, if you've ever seen the film Back to the Future. You know, Marty and Dr. Emmett are there trying to see what's going to happen in the future. And I think one thing we must think about about history, we don't learn from history. We are destined to make the same mistakes again. And I think it's a really important lesson. And whilst the science of cemented hip replacement has been scientific, it's not rocket science when it comes to deciding what you're going to do in your practice. So this is the National Joint Registry from the UK. It's been going 17 years, the biggest national joint registry in the, in the world. Back in 2003, 60% of what we did was fully cemented joint replacement. And that became less popular as time progressed. Uncemented joint replacement increased in popularity, and that carried on for about 10 years. But then something strange started to happen. The uncemented joint replacement started to become less popular. And over the last 10 years, there's been a gradual decline in the amount of uncemented joint replacement. During that time, the hybrid hip, cemented stem with an uncemented socket has increased in popularity. And now today as we speak, the number of cemented stems with an uncemented socket compared with, um, with fully uncemented are the same number. And yet there's still a fairly sizable proportion of all cemented hip replacement. So as it stands at the moment, actually, over 60% of all hip replacement done in the United Kingdom has got an element of cement in it. 25 to 30% are fully cemented. So cement is becoming more popular as time's gone on. So this isn't a message just from Wrightington, the sort of center of the cemented universe. This is actually a message from the whole of the UK with its national joint registry, looking at the results, deciding actually cement wasn't a bad idea in the first place. So why do we change things? 
And of course, if we look at the history of the bearing during the last 17 years, well, we've seen some wild fluctuations as fashions have come and gone and disasters have come and gone. We can see with the, with the orange hump when metal, when resurfacing had become very popular, the gray hump, ceramic on ceramic, hard on hard had become popular. And both of those have waned. And what we're left with is polyethylene articulating with either ceramic or metal as being the most popular choice. So we've really become very conservative, if you want. We've, we've gone back to very conventional bearings in the United Kingdom. We're, we're using polyethylene, definitely, maybe with ceramic, maybe with, uh, maybe with metal. And cement still continues and is increasing. And why have we done that? Well, I suppose why we've done that in many ways is because a realization that when you look at the data, the data actually is pointing us in, the, is in that direction. This isn't depending on me as a second generation Charlie disciple going out there and banging the pulpit and telling people what to do. This is the data speaking. This is in the hands of everybody. 98% compliance to the joint registry. It's not about one person producing their own personal series that nobody can ever possibly emulate. This is about everybody working, producing these sort of results. And the message is clear, cement is working well for us. I think when you reflect on cement, what you often do is think, well, cement was this very old thing that didn't sort of work so well. And then we've got a lot of nice new shiny stuff. And cement was in the backwaters, it was poor. But actually during all of this debate, all of this discussion, cemented hip replacements improved massively as well as the various techniques have improved, lavage, pressurization, how we do the operation, the results have got better. And we've certainly seen that at Wrightington with some of the long series that we've got, as you know, slight modification with the stem, but changing the technique, improving the technique, you know, closing the intermodullary canal, using pressurization. This has produced fantastic long-term results. And you don't have to fill the baby out with the bathwater. You don't have to get rid of the technique to try something new. You improve the technique. It's a bit like British cycling. When you look at Brailsford, how do you improve cycling? Well, what you do is you don't change everything. You don't throw everything away. You get each element and you maximize and improve the element of everything that you do. And that's what you need to do in joint replacement surgery and in cemented joint replacement surgery. And you can produce the best results there are to be had out of anything if you do it properly. You know, so from my point of view, I mean, it is a real, no, it isn't rocket science, it's a no brainer with such good long-term results. You know, a young woman like this that presents with a difficult set of hip problems, why would I do anything else in a cemented joint replacement? I can restore the hip center, I can put things where I want. And what I do know is that there are good long-term results. And actually what I also know is nothing lasts forever. And if you follow up cemented joint replacement, you can see it wear and fail over time, over a very long time, and you can revise it. There are so many things out there at the moment that are so difficult to revise. And I would argue that a cemented stem in a young woman, or young man in this case, you can revise it later on. Whereas if you have an uncemented device, which has become bonded to the bone, which fails at the bearing and taper level, and you've got stress protection and the bone has disappeared, you have a major problem on your hands. Cemented joint replacement copes brilliantly with anatomical variations, such as in the acetabulum or in, or in, the, in, in, the, in the femur itself. This sort of really difficult problem with long-standing deformity, um, you can put the components exactly where you want to put them and you know that the long-term results are good. And then with very deficient bone, whether it's a very elderly with osteoporotic bone, where cement is an obvious choice, or whether it's with metastatic disease, a fantastic way of getting good fixation to bone primarily without having to wait, long, wait for any form of integration. And actually, you know, I push it further on talking about cement and back to the future. I do think we should look as well at cement in revision surgery as well. And I know it's become unpopular in many senses, but the big problem I see all the time is that over-engineered first revision where someone puts something massive in when they could have done something very simple and very short and very biological with some bone graft. And then all of a sudden, if that fails, they've run out of bone, there's nothing left. 
and it's a real problem that over-engineered first revision keep it simple keep it short make your revisions look like primaries and this sort of case which i would argue these days you know you could you could revise that stem with an impaction grafting and a relatively short stem but when you start going along like happened here and you get an intraoperative fracture you go to something else that's distantly distantly fixed which then fails this is all the same case and all of a sudden from a very simple situation you replace the entire femur with metalwork and that's not where you want to be and cement allows you to recapture a very biological situation by using cement and bone graft and going short and not long you can get primary fixation with biological restoration of bone so in revisions with cement go short you don't have to keep going longer you use bone graft yes to restore cortical bone but also to make a cemented revision possible when the bone is very smooth inside the, the purpose of the bone grafting is not to restore the cortex the purpose of the bone grafting is to give you a rough surface that the cement will interdigitate with you, impaction grafting in the acetabulum is brilliant and here in the femur as well where, where you make a uh, what's been a multiply operated hip in the first place that when it's then failed again you've taken it back to a primary you made the primary look you made the, the revision look like a primary and with these sort of cases where you, you've got these massive uh, articulations that have failed with, with the use of bone graft and cement on both sides you can make your revision very much look like a primary and you've got a, a very simple situation you've got something to use next time and there may always be a next time you know because we are talking as Bodo said we maybe have 60 years of experience but we you know you're seeing patients in their 20s particularly their women i mean gosh women just live a long time you know and you know that they, they invariably have their mother sat outside with clinic who is in there is over 100 so we've really got a plan for the future so only go long if necessary but you can restore the bone i've got a number of cases where we've gone long and then maybe 20 years later we've been able to go short again because we've restored the bone and of course there's deep infection Cement gives you a fantastic way of treating deep infection with a one-stage revision. One-stage revision for deep infection. The reason the Americans don't like uh, one-stage revision for deep infection is they want to use an uncemented implant ultimately. But the results are so good from a cemented implant, why would you want to do that? You can just go straight to a cemented implant from an infected revision situation, which almost sounds impossible. And actually, all you've done, you've ended up making a really complex revision look like a primary. And then, you know, when we start restoring bone, this is somebody who's had multiple revisions, a young, uh, a young patient, you're getting a bigger and bigger socket, a jumbo socket, getting bigger and bigger, and you can just recapture the situation with bone graft and cement and uh, make it simple. And this is, this is an interesting case. In fact, a lady actually, who, she was a teacher from India, in fact, who's got a massive cavitatory defect. A really difficult situation. But if you look at the top right there, I've done a massive impaction grafting. We morselize bone graft and seven years later the bottom right picture you can see all of that bone is remodeled and we've regrown her pelvis and it's only cemented joint replacement with the bone graft that's allowed you to do that because the way the cemented socket then allows the forces to be transmitted to the bone with the loading of the iliac wing means the bone graft is alive and working rather than being stress protected by some massive pelvic metal titanium reconstruction of the pelvis we you know we've really gone back to a more normal situation and we could do something next time if we needed to and of course i don't need to go through the history of what uncemented metal and metal large bearings have done it turned what was a brilliant operation into a disaster and i really think you can't quite consider the bearings separately from fixation but cemented fixation with simple bearings avoid all of this sort of problem with bearing failure and reaction to debris. And the results speak for themselves, you know, cemented joint replacement followed by hybrid joint replacement have produced the best long-term results with the, less, the least chance of revision compared with anything else. And what's really interesting, if you break it down to components in hip surgery and say, what is the most likely component to be revised? Or the other way around which is the least likely component to be revised and it's very interesting the cemented socket is the least likely component of all components ultimately to be revised followed by the stem and cementless stem cemented cups much higher revision rate and obviously resurfacing 
than stem resurfacing large metal on metal, even worse still. I really recommend you pick up the last joint replacement, uh, the, the last National Joint Registry, and look at the data. So the data of uncemented and hybrid hits really show that it performs well and does outperform uncemented hits. If you look at adverse soft tissue reactions, the, the top two, much less adverse tissue reaction with cemented joint replacement than any other form. It's even better than, uh, than hybrid if it's, fully, if it's fully cemented. And actually, if you look at pain, cemented hips are less painful than uncemented hips if you do PROM scores on it. So I believe the data is there, never mind about going back to the future. I mean, it is the future. This is, you know, and it always has been. And of course, there's money. We have to talk about money. But why would we be spending money on things that are less good? I mean, I know there's always that issue, isn't it? If you think you're spending a lot of money, it must be a lot better. Well, gosh, we really know in hip replacement surgery that is just not the case. You can spend a fortune to make it worse. And that there's loads of people around the world that have done that. Our government have really taken it on board this. So we have a best practice tariff for hip replacement. And it's very interesting about what we're trying to incentivize. So as a hospital, you get an extra 500 pounds per case <clears throat> if you can demonstrate that your hip replacements have got a high functionality, that they're good, that they're not, they've got good, they've got good results measured by PROMs. If you're putting your data onto the National Joint Registry, then, then we're, we're happy to incentivize you. But what we've also said is if you're over the age of 70, at least 80% of your patients should be having cemented or hybrid hip replacement. And this was a bold step to make and a step that people have complained about. But the data supports that. Yes, we've added the caveat that if you can demonstrate that your uncemented joints are producing better results than the cemented in this age group, then we'll pay you the extra money. Guess what? We're hardly having to pay anybody because the results are not as good in general terms. So I put a cemented hip in pretty well everybody. And why do I do that? It's because I'm trained to do it. I feel confident. It's actually easy to teach, you know. There's excellent published results. It's not just the UK registry. From around the world, there's lots of data. In a practical sense, I'm a practical surgeon. It copes brilliantly with anatomical variation. It gets rid of that long-term stress protection, an uncemented joint in someone 20 or 30 years down the line, the bone has melted away like candle wax. It works brilliantly well, cement with bone graft. I can fix infection with a single operation. I fit the prosthesis to the patient. Revision is relatively easy. Yeah, it can be a bit tedious taking chipping cement out, but at least it's just chipping the cement and not chipping the cement out, not removing the entire bone because, uh, because of what uh, of the older prosthesis having been bonded to it. And it's really cost effective for society. And there's real evidence that improved techniques mean cemented joint replacement is better still. And in your hands, if you're worried about the way you've you're doing joint, cemented joint replacement, you can learn how to do it. It's much easier, I think, to teach and get a good result from a cemented joint replacement than from some of, of the hard and hard systems that are out there. And it is not difficult to teach and do. So thank you from Wrightington and the Centre for Hip Surgery. Yes. Cement is the future. And the big worry if you watch the film about Back to the Future was being left behind. Don't get left behind. And there's me mixing even more cement. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, hello, I thank you, thank you. Two wonderful uh, lectures. One is uh, taken to the back to the past and followed by back to future. Wonderful. A bit of housekeeping I have to do. Uh, let's stick up to the time. So we now go into the art of doing a proper cemented hip replacement. So I would invite uh, Mr. Matthew Hubble to talk on the preoperative planning and templating for cemented total hip arthroplasty, the traditional, the digital, and uh, also the CT-based uh, uh, planning for the Mako robo. So I invite uh, Mr. Matt Hubble to please uh, unmute yourself and uh, get your presentations and let's stick to the time, please.
Good evening, uh, everybody. Well, first of all, yeah. I'd just like to send my very best wishes to you all, uh, to the whole nation, really, from everybody in Exeter at this, at this terrible time. So we're going to have a little think about preoperative planning uh, and particularly about cemented total hip replacement because it's not the same. Uh, and there are some top tips that I'd like to share with you um, about the, 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 um, the ways that we can do that to get the best possible result. Uh, you should be aware that I'm involved with one of the cemented processes, the extra system, uh, and that myself and the unit I work at receives recompense for that. So what is different about a cemented total hip replacement? And Peter has alluded to this, you know, you are in control. You can put those components and particularly that stem anywhere in space that you want. And we have the power to choose. We have choice. We can choose where we put the components within that cement mantle. We can some insert it a little bit further. We can leave it a little bit out. We can rotate the version to get the version. So we can choose. But as Superman told us, with great power comes great responsibility. And the things are not going to find their way to the optimum position. They're not going to recreate the anatomy as well as they could unless you have a plan. And so we need to have a plan to get the best possible result. So what's important? What are we trying to achieve? Well, Peter's already alluded to um, the ease of ability to restore center rotation. We want to orientate the acetabular component to have the correct version, the correct inclination. And we want to try to put something of appropriate size. And my top tips when you're planning the acetabulum are to draw these three lines that you can see on that top x-ray. So the middle one I would draw first, and that is between the two teardrops, the inter teardrop line. I would then drop down and draw a line that lines up with the less trochanter. And immediately now I can measure, not just get a guess, but measure my leg length discrepancy. And then the, a line that I found invaluable if you've ever got any sort of acetabular defect is to draw this line that lines up with the roof of where the acetabulum used to be. We call this the acetabular roof line. Immediately then you get a feel of the defect that you've got and you can measure that. And here you can see it's 15 uh, millimeters, 1.5 centimeters. You know, that's a bit high for drifting up with an uncemented cup. It's a little bit high for a flange. It looks like you probably would want to put something in it. You've had those thoughts, you've got a plan. And here you can see we put a wedge in this case. You could have used the, the head here is pretty eroded. You could have used her head. Once you've planned and templated, you can decide what's likely size, what position you're going to have, where the center of rotation of that acetabular component will be, and what you're going to do about any defects. What about the femur? So the femur, we need to restore the anatomy of the hip. And if you want the patient to have the best possible function, you need to restore that offset, not too much, not too little, just restore to an appropriate offset so that their muscles work mechanically efficiently. You need to choose a stem that will fit in the femur, obviously, and a stem that will put, allow you to put the center of rotation of the hip in the same place as the native hip. And then you want to put that in a version of your choosing. You want to be able to control version, not the patient's anatomy. One of the problems with an uncemented hip is that frequently where the femoral component ends up is decided by the anatomy of the femur, not by you, the surgeon. And that applies as much as anything to version and very difficult to restore version in, in a retroverted native hip of you're using um, uncemented components. And then, of course, leg length. And we'll, we'll look at leg length a little bit more in a moment. So in the system I use, the stems are named because of the version that they, the offset that they recreate. And that makes life very simple. You know, if you've templated for a 44 offset, then you're going to work your way through the 44 range. And, and as you can see, there's very slim stems for people with narrow canals or very broad stems for people with broad canals. You're not having this problem with many uh, uncemented systems where as the stem gets bigger, the offset gets bigger and as the stem gets slimmer, the offset gets smaller and then you're, you've linked the two. You need to decouple the two so that you can choose a stem of the appropriate offset for that patient. Now I said I'd say a little something about leg length because I didn't understand this. I didn't train uh, at the center I work now and in my training, it was a long time before anybody explained to me that 
when you insert a stem, the only thing you change as you insert it is leg length. If you insert it one more millimeter, the leg is one millimeter shorter. If you leave it out one millimeter, the leg is one millimeter longer. You have changed nothing else. You haven't changed offset, you haven't changed version. So you change leg length by stem insertion depth, you change version by the, by the version of the stem, and you change offset by the offset that is built into the stem that you're inserting. And those are three independent variables. And people get very confused and they try to control leg length and, and offset with plus and minus heads. And those are not independent variables. And that is not the way that you will get the best restoration of anatomy. So leg length is controlled by the depth of stem insertion. And of course, you are completely free with the, to control that depth of insertion because you're inserting into a cement mantle and you can stop at any point and then the cement will polymerize and then that point that you've chosen is fixed in, in, uh, indefinitely. And then of course, you can move the antiversion of the stem, you can do a trial and think, no, I haven't got quite enough antiversion or I need a little bit less antiversion and you are in complete control in that femur to change version within the stem. The principles that I've just talked through are identical, whether you're just putting an acetate onto a, a traditional X-ray, or whether you're putting an acetate onto a computer screen, or whether you're using a software to do PACS um, a system, or whether you're using the CT-based robotic. And if we have time, I'll say a few words about PACS and CT-based, but the principles are the same. So, there are seven steps. We've gone through many of those steps now, but I would like to look at some top tips as we go through. Are the x-rays suitable? And that is one of the ways that you can get your templating wrong if you don't uh, appreciate that an arthritic hip tends to lie in external rotation. It tends to um, look as though the neck shaft angle is increased when the hip is externally rotated, and it appears as though the offset is reduced. So if you look on the hip on the left, it's lying in external rotation. You see a lot of the lesser trochanter, and it appears that the neck shaft angle is greater and the offset is less. This is a very common appearance, an x-ray like this, where the left hip is lying in external rotation. If you see that, the first thing I would do is I would template the opposite right hip to assess my femoral component and my femoral component positioning, because that is much more in the true plane of the x-ray. The other top tip is that most patients have had several x-rays before that very arthritic hip that hurts them so much that's lying in external rotation. So if we see here, the x-ray that I'm looking at was in 2019, but back in her packet, back in 2013, and she's had several pelvic x-rays in between. So if you look in the patient's packet, and here we see, that's how she is now when she's come to theatre. That's a difficult hip to template. The head is eroded, the acetabulum is eroded. That is what this hip looked like before, and that's in the packet there for you to guide you with your templating and your planning. So what do we, how do we do that? Well, we talked about the offset. We want a stem that recreates the offset and that fits in the canal. So here we've taken a stem that fits the canal nicely, and number three, but it's not enough offset. That's a 37.5. You can see that the center rotation of the hip is not the same place as the center of rotation of the stem. The stem is not enough. We choose a, a bigger one. This is the, the same size body, but with a bigger offset. So this is a number three again, but with a 44 offset. That looks just about right. And then this is my next top tip. Probably the only, if you're only gonna remember one top tip, remember this one. Once you've decided where you want to put that stem in the femur to restore the center rotation of the hip, look at the tip of the trochanter, and the shoulder of the prosthesis and measure that distance. Because if you measure that distance and make a note of it and then insert your stem that far in the case, then you will be within a few millimeters of the correct position. So template it, measure the distance and then insert the stem or insert your rasp at least to that point and then do your first trial and make an assessment of the stability and the soft tissues and then adjust if you need to. So the stem insertion depth is the guide to femoral uh, insertion depth. And the easiest way to do that, I take a needle in theatre, the needle that I infiltrate with local anaesthetic at the end of the case, and I feel for the bony tip, because it's difficult with the soft tissues of it, 
and know exactly where the bony tip of the trochanter is, I mark my rasp handle, the distance that I templated, in this case 15 millimeters, and I insert the stem so that the, the mark on the rasp handle is opposite the tip of the trochanter. And I'm sure John will show that. And when you do that, you know that you've got to within a millimeter or two of your templated position. So here's an example, very valgus hip. The center of rotation of this lady is well above the tip of the trochanter. So we're not going to want to insert our stem so far if we're going to restore her leg length. So here we see the shoulder of the prosthesis is just at the level of the tip of the trochanter and her leg lengths look very nice compared to the opposite side. Here's another lady, very different anatomy. She's got coxa vera. The center of rotation of her hip is well below the tip of her greater trochanter. So we've planned it, we've made an assessment, we've got a measure we're going to go for. And in this, is, uh, in this case, it's 25 millimeters below the tip of the trochanter, but it's, and yet we've achieved a correction of her leg length nicely. 25 millimeters, about the maximum I normally would insert a stem. I warn people if they're more various than that, they're going to have a longer leg because you'll get impingement of the GT on, on the pelvis um, if you insert much more than that, uh, and then you have instability issues. And don't forget what we said about neck. The neck is not uh, a device for lengthening or increasing offset. It's a device that lengthens and increase offset. So if you think you want a plus head, you'll need to insert the stem a couple of millimeters further uh, and vice versa. If you, go, if you think you're gonna use a minus head, you just want to not insert the stem quite so far to compensate for the fact that it changes both. And then my final top tip is that I write that on the swipes on the swabs board in theater. So that's written there. I think what cup I think I'm gonna use, what stem I think I'm gonna use, how far in the stem insertion depth and whether I'm gonna use a standard or a plus or minus head. And that's all written there and the leg length difference on the board in front of me. The whole team can see that. They know what I'm likely to use and we can, and that helps as an aid memoir to me and a guide to efficiency for the team. So here, the case we saw at the beginning, it's all very well talking about it in theory. Does it work in practice? Well, we see we've, we've found our acetabular defect. We've decided, yep, we're gonna graft it. We've restored center rotation. We've corrected for leg length and we've made a happy patient. Everything I've said is done exactly the same if you use the software. We use OrthoView software. It's exactly the same. It basically has digital templates that you maneuver on the screen all that you must have is an ability to scale that uh, and we use a 25 millimeter marker for the x-ray but the technique is identical to what i've just said uh, we have one of the mako robots um, and that's ct based planning and this really highlights the uh, incredible ability to restore anatomy with a cemented component we have a, a lot of north american surgeons have come to you to see us operate uh, want, because of great interest in the States now about using cement, and they often want us to see us using the robot and cement. And you see this light bulb moment in their heads when they suddenly realize that they could also, if they did this, control stem insertion, stem version, and leg length completely and easily if only they used a cemented stem. And because the two are marriage made in heaven, with an uncemented, uncemented stem, the robot basically tells you how far from where you want it to be you've actually got. With a cemented stem, it tells you what change you could make to give you complete restoration of anatomy. So a cemented stem is absolutely ideal with a robot. You do planning in two and 3D. So here is the cup planned. The green dot is the cup position. The, the, the pink dot is the femoral center rotation. The blue dot is the is the uh, prosthesis center for the femoral stem, exactly as we did with the uh, templating. It's done on the robot. You can measure your stem insertion depth and then you can restore anatomy as planned. You can do a trial. The robot tells you uh, how close you are. And here we have an example of a trial versus opposite hip. We're down to zero, one, you know, virtually identical. I think the big mistake is chasing zero. It doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be a soft tissue balance and a stability issue as well. So that is the difference with cemented uh, planning. You have control, but you need a plan. We like to think that we love cement because we can get length, 
offset and version easily. And then finally, a little plug, I cannot cover uh, pre-op planning and templating in, in the time that will allow for me. We've just published our 50th anniversary book, which has chapters on anatomical restoration, chapters on planning, chapters on the use of the robot. And if you'd like to know any more, please do log on to Exit Hit Units, where it's a non-profit making exercise. So it's a very good value book. And if you'd, if you'd like to know more, uh, please do make use of that as a as a um, educational guide. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matt. Uh, I just have to make a slight change in the um, schedule. Uh, Professor Pachore has to go for a, a condolence meeting of Dr. Sankar Agarwal. I know Professor Temple has also some personal commitments, but before that, just 10 minutes, uh, Professor Pachore is going to talk about bone cement implantation syndrome. And then we'll get into the business of doing a cemented uh, hip replacement and Dr. You know, Chun will end the uh, lectures by talking on are all the cemented hips uh, the same. So Dr. Pachore, please come in, uh, unmute. For your talk on the bone cement implantation syndrome. Please unmute yourself. Please un unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, uh, thank you for that change. Uh, I'm extremely thankful. I must actually thank Professor uh, Monty that bringing out this cemented uh, hip orthoplasty back to future. I'm really, really thankful. And also thanks for the uh, introduction, kind introduction from Professor Monty. I think uh, bone cement was uh, bone cement was introduced in 70s. Basically, it is polymer. All of us know, and it was all described after 10 years of introduction of a bone cement. This syndrome was described. I think it's totally underreported uh, because of various reasons, various uh, actually clinical signs, and it is very, very, very much underreported. And it happens during uh, uh, hip orthoplasty in any stage. I think most common is the femoral, uh, femoral reaming, that is a time femoral reaming, and as well as from the, when the insertion of the stem. And that's the commonest thing which happens. A definition, I re we really don't know because the reason is there's a uh, conflict of clinical uh, signs which are included. Some anesthetist says there's only hypoxia because of hypoxia, this is the syndrome which is described, but it can be hypotension, it can be cardiac arrhythmias, and most common is the increased pul uh, pulmonary uh, resistance. That is the most common which thing happens in this syndrome. I think we must thank regarding this uh, grading which is described. I think grade one, which is totally missed by anesthetist, by surgeon for everyone, because it's a very, very mild hypoxia which we develop. Grade two is a severe hypoxia, more than uh, PO2, more than uh, less than 88, and there's a hypertension, the fall uh, almost about to 40, uh, 40 millimeter of mercury. And grade three is a very bad sign that uh, usually requires uh, CPR, and that's uh, most of the time mortality is extremely high. I think our anesthetist has to be extremely, uh, very crucial about the uh, grade two. That is a time you can save most of your patients. What about the incidents? I think that, again, is very much underreported. There are two large series coming from one is Parvizi, from other series, that there are uh, 23,000 cemented hips and they had 23 deaths. And uh, they're almost equal in cemented THR and hemiorthoplasty. The similar has been described by I think in 21,000, there are 19 deaths have been described. But one important message from these two papers are, Almost 14,000, 15,000 uncemented, uh, uncemented hips, and the, there was no single mortality. So there's no question that something is happening with the bone cement. What about the clinical features? Clinical fe uh, features suggest that cerebral, uh, cerebral vessel embolization. Patients, they start delirium, or they develop a neurological, mild neurological deficit if they are awake. Second important thing is that the embola escapes the canal through permanent circulation, or sometimes the patent femoral wood. And if you have the USG, USG then almost 40 to 60% of the patient undergoing hip orthoplasty will show some amount of embolic phenomena on, uh, on ultrasound. And that's a very, very large number. But we don't get that amount of patient with the symptoms on, on this. What about pathophysiology? We are still not understood this a real, what exactly happens with this syndrome. 
there are four theories which are described. One is monomer mediated, which has not been accepted. Second is embolic mod that has been accepted by many. And third is histamine, and other is multi multi mod. So what about the monomer? Monomer release in the circulation definitely causes vasodilatation, but is not supported because there is no enough level in the blood to cause this. There's a lot of experimental work has gone, so we really don't know this whether the monomer can cause this. But definitely, presence of embolic material definitely does something. And there are three ways it happens. One is a mechanical stimulation which develop, which damages endothelial. And second is may release vasoactive or pro-inflammatory substance. And thirdly, release chemical mediator, which causes this, uh, which causes the hypertension, hypoxia, and various, uh, various things which uh, happens with this syndrome. The third is histamine release and hypersensitivity. A significant increase in histamine concentration is still not clear, but there is no question that complement activation is important and that's why the patients do develop a bronchospasm or sometimes uh, and the vasoconstriction leading to bronchospasm. So there's no question, something is related to histamine. And lastly, multimodalist there was combination and depends on what is the physiological response to the patient. And that's a, most of the time it is a maybe a combination, combination of factors. What about the risk patients in this uh, cemented hips are? I think we all know that it's a age. Most important is pre-existing physical reserve. And most important, which we miss, and our anesthetists they miss, is a pre-existing pulmonary hypertension. If the patient has got pulmonary hypertension, I think there's a highest risk of cemented hip for as far as this is concerned. Osteoporosis, bone metastasis, fracturing itself is got on a high uh, problem. And ASA grade, three to four. And just now, uh, Peter K was talking about national registry and thanks to this national registry, which gives enough data to the most, uh, most of the part of the world. And look at the da their data. 14% of the patients are grade 3 ASA, and that's a very large number of these patients are, and that's from National Registry. And patients who are on diuretic, diuretic and warfarin are very, again, problematic. COPD, there's no question. I think one has to be very, very care careful. And this is one something new which has come, femoral canal wider than 21 millimeter because vascular channels are completely open, and that's the reason chances of embolic phenomena are very high with this for patients. The other risk factors are previously uninstrumental. That's a virgin canal. They have chances of much more than the patients who have already got an intramedullary nail and a couple of things because the uh, inside there's a glistening uh, uh, vortexes and there are no opening channels. And that's why the chances are less. Using long stem also has got a little bit of high risk. High risk. What are the safety guidelines? I am very thankful to the Association of Britain, uh, Great Britain and Ireland and British Orthopedic Association and British Genetic. In 2018, they actually came together and made some safety guidelines for these patients. So how to identify these patients and how to prepare the team and everybody has to be very careful and there is always called as a, a WHO checklist timeout, timeout phenomena in the anesthesia, uh, in the anesthesia department. So as a surgeon, Inform anesthetist before prepare, preparation of cement and during cementing. I think he, he has to make him aware. And another important thing and from anesthetist side, adequate preparation of recitation, vigilance, and look at the signs of cardiopulmonary compromise and you can treat them early. You can at least reduce the mortality of these patients. What about the surgical, uh, how can we as a surgeon can uh, reduce this risk? One is medullary lavage, dry, pack it nicely, Minimize the stem length. Don't use a long, too long stems. Use non-cemented if there's a high risk group of patients. Venting system. And there was some report, uh, I have no, I'm not, uh, there is nothing much about the distal venting system. So used to, there are only one or two papers showing the distal venting system, but there's a high risk of fracture because of the large hole. So I don't know whether the today this practice or not in writing turn. So uh, retrograde cementing, there's no question and mix the cement in vacuum. There's an, uh, enough data we, available for us. And don't be too aggressive for high-risk patients. For young patients, yes, you've got to go what is grade one cementing. This is a, uh, this is a uh, excellent paper coming. That's vacuum mix and open method. The mortality in the vacuum mix was only 2.8%. 
and open method was mortality was 13%, which is very high in fractional femur patients, not as a routine uh, totally patients. So there's no question the vacuum experiment is best. Unfortunately, uh, we can't use it for uh, because of the cost constraint, but I think this is an ideal way to do a vacuum mixer. So how do you, uh, what anesthetic risk is reduction? I think uh, they have to, uh, the nitrous oxide is not good uh, as far as concerned. So the anesthetist should not use the nitrous oxide as far as the anesthesia is concerned. There is one important message from my uh, talk is, these patients are overnight star. Next day morning, they get in the theater at induction room and immediately they are taken inside. That should not happen. They should have adequate, uh, adequate intravenous fluid, at least 500 to 7, 750 uh, cc, uh, ml of uh, IV fluid before they are taken in the, uh, uh, before induction. So very important step. Uh, because the volume is very important for them. Unless the patient has got an ejection factor which is low, then you uh, you have to consider your uh, uh, you have to ask the physician how much fluid we, they can give. And very high risk patient. Two important uh, things we have to do is one is intraarterial pressure monitor and central venous pressure. Uh, this can give a very good guideline how uh, we can treat them and reduce some amount of mortality mortality if we have these two invasive monitors. So what is the role of uh, cortisone? We really don't know, but I think olden time we used to use, but now we have stopped using. I think uh, we have to ask some of the experts because this what they say, prevent release of anaphylactic toxins and that can uh, the, uh, that can develop the oxygen des uh, desaturation. So that's, uh, but the dose is almost about two gram. I had no idea. We actually stopped using this uh, to be frank. What about epinephrine? There is one institute, they had seven deaths actually in, in a row, and they decided that we should use a low dose epinephrine infusion. We learned from these two or, two or three papers that what they need is a volume. If the volume is not there, if the central venous pressure is almost more than 10 to 13 centimeter of water, then they will all right. If your central venous pressure is down, the chances of embolic phenomena are very, very high, and that's again important finding of this from papers. I think we need a great coordination between the anesthetist and a surgeon. I think I request, and I, this is my actual routine in my theater, my anesthetist should, have, should not use a mobile phone. That is a dictum which I have in the, my operating theater because they need to monitor this and they should not be on the laptop or they should not be on the mobile. And, they, and time is, timer is very important. When we do a mixing, mixing there is an actually, uh, we have a stopwatch in the operating theater. When we start with a uh, mixing, we start with a minute. So if somebody shouts, it's one minute, two minutes, and the anesthetist uh, makes uh, you make them away, uh, and that's a very important. That's the time actually we have to pick up these patients. How do we pick up this? I think hypoxia, one of the most important thing which happens, hypertension. A patient who is under spinal anesthesia and suddenly he starts delirium and become unconscious. I think you are 100%. There's an embolic phenomenon has taken place. Pulmonary hypertension, but we can't measure every time. It is not possible pulmonary edema, and sometimes patient starts having a bronchospasm, and that's the time we must suspect that this patient has probably got this syndrome, syndrome, and that's the reason we have to keep in uh, mind. I think communication between surgeon and anesthetist before operation, not on the op operation table, because everybody should know what is his job actually. So the most important first sign you get is fall of CO2. Uh, CO2, that is an ideal first sign, and which sometimes follows if the patient is under spinal anesthesia. Second sign you get is a dyspnea and delirium, and that's a very early sign, and that's the time we have to pick up and not later on. So uh, the management will all depends on what the grading, which I just showed you, probably grade two and grade three, we have to be, uh, grade two, we have to be very aggressive. Grade three is a very difficult situation because it requires a CPR. If the patient is in lateral position, you have to make the patient supine and start your resuscitation. So treat uh, cardiovascular collapse, the uh, aggressive resuscitation and antropic drugs are most, most important in these patients. And what I can summarize in a few lines is, the I think we, shall, we have to identify these patients. And uh, most important is the fractionic papers, elderly patients, pulmonary hypertension and low ejection factor are another important thing. And another is arterial septal defects. You sh we should be very, very careful with these patients with arterial septal defects. Joint concentration preoperatively between physician, anesthetist and surgeon. 
IV fluid before intubation. This is one important, very important message. Please give at least 500 to 700 uh, ml. Uh, invasive mandatory only for high risk patients. We do it, uh, we do put CVP and arterial pressure lines. Surgeon must inform uh, before mixing the cement and vacuum mix is the best cement and all other things as a surgeon we know that retrograde, short stem, no aggressive pressurization and a close vigilant by a team members. And first sign which I told you is a fall of PCO, PCO2 is the first sign of the syndrome, syndrome. and treat aggressively these patients 100% oxygen, vasopressor, volume replacement, and a team approach, which we can save a couple, couple of these patients. I thank you for the attention. I'm very thankful again for my change of uh, timing has taken. Thank you, Mo Professor Monti. Uh, I, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Pachore. So uh, it's, it's a bit of caution for all of us about uh, uh, cemented hip uh, arthroplasty, but that doesn't mean that uh, we are uh, trying to tell that cemented doing a cemented is dangerous in any way. Basically, as Professor Pachore tell, tells, we have to look into our way of practicing, of doing any surgery for that matter. And that takes uh, care of this particular uh, syndrome. And uh, if anybody has any questions for Professor Pachore, can raise their hand. Dr. Gopal, okay. Dr. Gopal. So, so, I, think, uh, I think he can answer yes, over sir. the chat box. Chat yeah. box. We can answer and uh, in the meantime. Okay, uh, sir, uh, sir, difference of cementing syndrome while performing uh, THR and also TKR cementing. Is there any difference while you fix the components in TKR as regards THR, sir? Please type it in the you know chat box. Uh, Dr. Pacher will type it. Yeah, in. I will. I will speak to him later. Sure. Okay. 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 So okay. thank we, you. Thank you. We go ahead to the next lecture and we come into the business of doing a proper uh, cemented uh, hip replacement. So uh, the next topic is uh, by Professor A.J. Timperle and uh, he's going to talk on the cementing techniques in total hip arthroplasty. So Professor Timperle to kindly unmute himself and uh, yeah. Okay, can you hear me okay and see the pictures? Absolutely, you, you are your dot on. That's okay, great. thank you. So I'm going to give you a short presentation on the way to cement uh, total hip replacement, particularly the femoral component. And in follow-up to Dr. Pachor's point, I mean, there's no doubt the bone cement implant syndrome does happen, but there are lots of things to mitigate against it. And in fact, there are plenty of papers now saying that showing that the mortality rate using uncemented stems is higher after almost time, all time points beyond about 24 hours. So there is an increased, slightly increased risk on the day of surgery, but then because of the increased risk of fracture and other things of using an uncemented implant, the mortality rate is higher. So I, I can't agree with the one slide he shows that you should use an uncemented implant. I, I don't think that's correct. I think what we need to do, as he was stressing, was do a good cementing technique uh, and mitigate the risks that there are. And I think there's one other point to make is that I think you, all of the uh, people who presented so far would agree with one thing, that if we only had uncemented femoral components and somebody came up with the idea of a cemented femoral component, they would get the Nobel Prize for medicine because it is such an advance in so many uh, other ways. So the challenge with cementing is to establish this durable mechanical interlock between the implant and bone. And of course, the cement is part of the implant. It needs trabecular bone with which to uh, get contact so it's well fixed. And then we know from the work of the pathologist Archie, Archie Malcolm that that interface osseo integrates. And that's been shown uh, uh, to be in the long term. So if we look at the technique, I will show you uh, the bone preparation and then actually uh, doing the, the femoral cementing. The neck cut, as Matthew has said, isn't really important if you use a collarless device and you'll make it slightly longer or slightly shorter, depending whether it's a valgus or a varus neck. Uh, what, it's usually about a finger breadth above the less trochanter. Uh, so then if we carry on, we want to access the femoral canal and you want to create a very accurate slot so that you can um, uh, have a, a, a closed uh, cavity in which to pressurize the cement. And usually when you take that piece of bone out, there's a bit of uh, cortex at the back of the trochanter there that you need to remove. So once you've taken your slot, put that slot with the degree of antiversion that you think might be useful, and then use a taper pin reamer 
and develop that uh, recess into the lateral part of the trochanter so that you can get a straight run down the femur. So we usually use two of these uh, tapered devices. Um, here again, you can see on the live film here, you can use an osteotome to create that slot very accurately. You can see that the version of the stem that we're going to use is already being dialed in to some extent. And we're trying to leave strong trabecular bone. That's very important. You can use nibblers as well as the tape pin reamer to get out laterally into the trochanter. And then one of the important points uh, about mitigating the risk of embolism into the circulation is we use a lavage every time we're about to instrument the femur. So we have a pressurized lavage system. And every time before we put any instrument down the femur, we lavage aggressively and suck the fat and the marrow contents away. So then if we, we need to size the, uh, the femoral canal to put a plug, you can use a bone plug, which they do in Wrightington, or you can use one made of acrylic bone cement that we use. If you do that, they come in two millimeter increments and you need just to size the femoral canal so that we know it's gonna be occluded just beyond the end of the stem tip. Now, Matthew has mentioned to you how to accurately get the leg lengths correct and how the offset is completely independent of the leg length. And so we're going to measure and uh, during interoperatively how far down we're going to put that stem. So as Matthew has said to you, you want to know the distance that you introduce that stem, the shoulder of that implant from the tip of the great trochanter. And interoperatively, we will use a needle to find the most prominent part of the greater trochanter. And then, so we usually use a spinal needle here and then measure down to where the shoulder of the implant is and get it millimeter perfect. So hello. we will, hello? Yeah, you're, on, you're on presenter mode still. Can you go to slideshow? Uh, Johnny, Johnny go to slideshow, slideshow please, yeah. Oh. No, I think you can't do, you have to close it and again reshare the slide show. Uh, do you want me to do that or should I just continue in this mode? Uh, we can't see much of the details of the slide, you know. Okay, so you want me to close it and bear with me. Can you see it now? Uh, it's again showing the same screen. Yeah. It's basically in the presenter mode. So yeah, it's in the presenter mode. We have to go to slideshow. John, can can you share your screen now? You can check it. If there is some issue, then we can go to the same mode, no problem. Yeah, yeah, uh, now it looks great, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry about that. No problem. It's never happened before. I don't know what's wrong with it today. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're looking for the distance from the stem tip uh, to, to um, the stem tip to the shoulder of, of the implant. And so if you measure 50 millimeters, what we do interoperatively is measure from the shoulder of the implant on the brooch handle and make a mark on that. So we now know that when that mark of 15 millimeter is against the tip of the greater trochanter, 
then the shoulder of the brooch and therefore the shoulder of the implant will be at the correct leg length. So during preparation, we will usually start with the offset that we have templated for, with the implant perhaps one size smaller than the one we're going to insert. You will see that we're not removing all the trabecular bone. You need that for the mechanical fixation. But then we will insert this down to uh, the, the, the point uh, that the leg length is correct as shown by the, uh, the mark on the brooch. Uh, you can't see the march on this particular one, but as you get down there, uh, you, you, it will be there. So we start with one size uh, less, and then we go down with the actual implant, putting it, dialing in the amount of version that we're intending to put into the stem. There's the mark we're putting on it. So just use a, a sterile marker pen. We'll put a mark on that. Here we're finding the tip of the trochanter. There was a question uh, about how to find that. If you use a, uh, a needle, you can find the most prominent part because uh, it's usually clothed, obviously clothed in tendon. And we now know that that's the leg length that you want. The other thing point uh, to mention is that with this particular stem, there are marks, those round holes, we will mark that against the less trochanter uh, when we've decided on the leg length. So at this point, we can do a trial reduction You'll check the, uh, if you've cut them, the external rotators, check that the, the, they are about right, that you haven't over uh, stuffed it, check the leg length, and then go through the whole sequence of extension, abduction, external rotation, flexion, adduction, internal rotation, and also the kick test, very sensitive to changes in offset and leg length. And we will check all of those things to make sure we have stability and we have balancing of the soft tissues. Uh, extremely important. So again, here you can see we're checking by inflection, adduction, internal rotation that it is stable. And then if we are happy with that, obviously we can adapt at this point and increase the leg length by leaving the stem out or uh, reduce it by pushing it in a bit more. And we make a mark where we want to put the stem down to, the mark on the stem that will be opposite that cut portion of the calcar. Um, so now uh, interoperatively, we're going to lavage, we're going to insert the canal, uh, the plug on the uh, introducer here. The marks are the same, so it puts it one centimeter distal to uh, where the stem tip is going to be. The actual uh, plug is made of polymethylmethacrylate, so it bonds to the uh, cement mantle. And then we will put it down so that that introducer introduces it beyond the stem tip. The effect of the club is very important. If you have an unplugged canal, you will get the pressure uh, rise shown by the blue lines here. So if you look proximally, you get very poor rises in pressure. If you insert the stem into a plugged canal and uh, with proximal occlusion, you get all the way up here. So you get much greater increases in pressure uh, distally and uh, uh, by ratio uh, proximally if you use a plug. So it's very, very important. And here again, showing that you need to lavage at every time you're going to instrument the canal. So uh, I would criticize this video a little bit because I think it should be absolutely pearly white. And it's no good using a, uh, a syringe and trying to aggressively wash it. It needs to be a pressurized lavage system to clean the interstices of the bone, uh, uh, of, of marrow and blood. And we leave a suction catheter down there to remove uh, all of that uh, fluid. And then we leave that suction catheter down there while we do uh, uh, introduce the cement from below upwards, as soon as the suction catheter is uh, full, we pull it out. And then in retrograde fashion, we fill the canal and then pressurize. Uh, that's why it's so important to make this, this shape at the top end of the femur, which is very accurate. And then we use this pressurizer, the yellow, which has a rather obtuse angle to it. So it doesn't go into the canal very far, which means that you're pressurizing the cement into the trabeculae right at the top end of the femur. And if we look interoperatively, you can see how dry it is. There should be very little blood, if any, that comes up after you've aggressively lavaged. As soon as the uh, suction catheter is full, we pull that out, retrograde fashion, snap off the end of the, uh, of the gun, and then continue to inject cement until the viscosity of the pressure of the cement is rising. So with the palacos, you will normally be in, uh, starting to inject uh, at one minute, you will pressurize until about three, three and a half minutes, 
and then introduce the stem. With, with simplex, it's quite a lot longer. You'll probably wait for five minutes, so you'll have several minutes of pressurization before you uh, introduce the stem. And the effect of this femoral seam is shown here. So if you use the old Charlie method of finger packing, you do induce uh, increases in pressure, uh, but you can see there are transient spikes in pressure. This was uh, from Dr. Clive Lee, who did some work measuring these pressures in the canal. If you occlude the proximal femur here and continue to inject cement, you get a sustained rise of pressure. So you're forcing the cement into the trabecular bone, and importantly, you're preventing some uh, blood accumulating at the cement bone interface. And here, the spikes of pressure are different are quantums of cement go. Every time the ratchet of the gun forces a bit more cement into the canal, you get an increase uh, in pressure. When the stem is inserted, put a finger over the calcar area. This has several uh, reasons of doing this. One, it raises the pressure as you're introducing the stem. So again, it's forcing more cement into the mantle, uh, into the uh, endosteal surface of the bone. It also stops you putting the stem in varus. The most common mistake is to put the stem in varus if you have not opened the trochanter widely enough laterally. Uh, and then when you're down to that mark, you can take your finger off, check your leg length, uh, and then just very carefully remove the stem introducer. So you can see there's no blood at this interface at all, and there really shouldn't be. You introduce the stem, keep your thumb over there. If you left it a little bit late and it's difficult to push down, take your thumb off, it'll make it easier. Uh, but push it down until that mark that you made, uh, that you've noted on the femoral component is against the calcar. So it was the middle hole, you go right down and you've dialed in the amount of version that you want. As Matthew said, the offset's built into the stem. So now we know the leg length uh, is perfect. And the effect of the thumb on the medial aspect of the femoral neck is shown here. So if you introduce the stem into an unplugged canal, you get the effect of the blue line. Uh, if you have proximal occlusion, you get the effect of the red line. So again, you induce higher pressures and you get better penetration of cement if you're uh, using your thumb. So what we're trying to do effectively is pressurize before, during and after stem insertion to protect the interface and to get the very best mechanical fixation. And then once the stem is inserted, the cement is really quite viscous by this time. Um, you don't want it to move within the cement mantle. We put this horse collar, it's called a horse collar, around the stem on top of the polymerizing mass of the cement. And the effect of this is to slow the rate of fall of pressure within the canal. Uh, and we keep it on until the cement has actually gone off. And here again is a slide from Clive Lee. So he measured the, uh, the femoral bleeding pressure within the canal and he plotted it on this graph. And that was the highest pressure that he ever measured in the, in the femur. And importantly, the horse collar doesn't stop the pressure falling in the canal, but it keeps it above the highest pressure of back bleeding he ever measured until polymerization is complete. So in that way, you've protected uh, the interface. So these are the, the different steps of preparation and cementing that are important. But in terms of safety, the most important thing is lavage, lavage, lavage and clear the endosteal surface of the bone of, uh, of uh, marrow contents. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Timperley. It was wonderful. Uh, your talk following the talk of uh, bone implant implantation syndrome. So that makes a lot of things, uh, the message goes on very clearly the advantages of doing a proper cementing technique. So what a way to send, uh, end this uh, first session of uh, this webinar by uh, a hardcore uh, cemented uh, Asian, Dr. David Chun, who's going to talk on are all cemented hips the same. So Dr. David, please unmute yourself and come to the screen share mode. Thank you very much, Vaj. Yes. Well, um, <laughs> I guess I'll pull, I, I'm bringing up the rare again, as usual. Uh, are all cemented hip replacements the same? This is a very important question that we should ask when we're analyzing the results of what we are doing with hip replacements. Um, oh, is it not changing? Okay. So you can see here that this is the oldest arthroplasty register we have. We tend to use arthroplasty registers to make a lot of decisions about what implants we want to use for ourselves because, you know, Clearly, there's a, you know, a lot of different people have done different kinds of hips on, on all sorts of patients, and this is the overall result.
what you will see that this register began in 1979. That's a very important thing to know. This register began in 1979. Charlie invented his hip in 1962. And it was widely used by the late 1960s into the 70s in Britain. And many of the initial results that are very good are not reflected in that registry. And as we know, this version of it, the 1962 version was a monoblock prosthesis, had a smooth polished stem, a rectangular cross section, rounded edges, uh, a 22 millimeter head with a small collar uh, and uh, a uh, flange cup. Not, not the OG cup, but just a flange cup uh, made of uh, high density polyethylene. Um, and some of these were actually put in, in the United States. This is a series uh, that was begun by Dick Johnston and uh, his student, uh, Professor John Callaghan, uh, religiously follows up those patients. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, I think uh, there may be a 30 year one out, but I've not seen it. Um, this, this is 25 year report on the 330 patients done between 1970 and 1972. Remember the date, 1979 is a different date. This is 1970 to 1972. This much predates the Swedish register. And um, so at the end of 25 years, 62 of these patients were still alive. And of these 62 patients, um, actually, um, uh, so 59 patients, 62 THR. Um, when you look at it, the failure rate is very, very low for the stem. Okay, uh, if you look at the whole series, it was nine patients out of three hundred sixteen patients, and uh, uh, five had failed in fifty nine patients that were still alive, and had to be raised. So it's not a very large number. So this is the thing that we have to think about when we think about which heart Charlie hip is the one that was successful. Actually, that particular hip was the flat back. This is the first one you could see it in, in the picture I showed you. And then people did things to it and changed it and uh, you know, in, in an effort to improve things. So this is a, re a report in 1993 by uh, Ian Diamond, who's a friend of mine and uh, Professor Desmond Dow. And they were in South Africa at the time and they looked at a whole series of patients uh, who had been done uh, with Chinese stamps of different types. And th so this is a report of 666 patients uh, done between 1970 and 1986. Uh, the first generation had been followed up eight years uh, and they had the surgery. 1970 to 1977, again, this predates the Swedish register. And then the next generation, this will be the kind of hit that went into the Swedish register is 1975 to 1986. Again, followed up maybe a shorter period of time and the report was, was written in 1993. So, Clearly, there was a problem with the first generation of, of stems. They just cracked. So, like, you know, it's not a lot of them cracked, but quite a significant number cracked uh, over the years. Uh, but uh, loosening wasn't a big problem. So, people decided to improve things. And they came up with this thing called a round back. And so, when you look at the original series of flat backs, you can see that fracture was a problem but loosening was not. If you look at the round backs, fracture was not a problem. That's in the gray bars there. But you can see the rate of loosening for those round backs. It was very, very much higher. So there is a difference between the two types of cemented sips, both called Charlie, by the way. And, and you can see that we, we, if you look at the probability of failure rate at uh, 10 years um, in the first generation of stems, the flat backs, uh, they had a fract stem fracture rate of 4.1%, have been reduced considerably. But if you look at stem loosening, right, you went, uh, you converted the problem of stem fracture to a much greater problem, a three times greater problem of stem loosening. And really, the old series never had stem loosening as a problem. Okay, so in retrospect, two things were changed to make things better. They got the metal better. Ultron steel made fractures less likely. However, because they changed the surface character of the round back, you can see in that picture there, it's quite matte. Um, then the rate of loosening uh, increased considerably. And I'm gonna talk about that after I address the Exeter ex experience. It's, it's nice to have both the Charlie boys and the Exeter boys here because like, you know, everyone's involved in this, okay? 
So, so the Exeter experience and like those tips that came out at the beginning, great results, 3% stamp failure, 21 years. Not really that different from uh, what John Callaghan was reporting, okay? And, and, and Robin Bing uh, said at the time, and he actually came to Malaysia and gave several lectures about this, and he said, basically all of them had to be the same by law. And in, in this case, the law was not an ass. It actually did something good. Um, so from 1975, to 1975, very few stamps came loose, okay? But because the stamp fractures, they changed the quality of the steel and um, they made it uh, tougher and didn't break. But again, they also made that stem more rough and that became loose. Um, this experience is reflected also in uh, Donald Howey's report on, a, uh, on the Exeters. Um, he took uh, 20 stems of each, uh, matte and polished. And uh, you can see here that the, the failure rate of the matte stems was four after five years, and, and uh, the polished stem was one after nine years. Sorry, uh, one after nine years, and no polished stems were revised. So it was decided then that the matte exeter stems increased the failure rate by 400%, and we no longer see them on the market anymore. It's been off the market like forever. Okay. And then Danny Collis, uh, also an acquaintance of mine, uh, found the same thing with American hips. And this is a hip that was done in 1992. And you can see that by 1997, five years later, there's enough use and seize and pain in the patient to be re revised. And their conclusion was also that the polish stem was way better than the, uh, un uh, than the rough stem. And they then talk about bone lysis, which is really a very, very big problem. Um, and this, when I was training, uh, was widely known as cement disease and more about that later as well. So it is clear that not all cemented stems perform equally well. Matte or rough stems have a greater tendency for loosening. And we really need to look at why this is so. So remember I talked about cement disease, really is cement the culprit, is poly the culprit? They're saying that what, well, the cement's uh, causing some kind of reaction from the body and, and uh, you know, uh, the, the, the polyethylene uh, break, breakup particles is uh, causing a lot of uh, problems with the interface. But is that really true? Um, we know that aseptic loosening happens in both cemented uncemented, and uncemented THR. So could it be something else? Um, if, you, if you see this article by Small Street, Tom Small Street, which was published uh, in 1992, uh, it actually states that the culprit is more likely to be hydrostatic pressure. And his hypothesis was that you, your hip generates a lot of uh, fluid pressure uh, when you're walking and moving around. And if that uh, space that's available for the fluid opens up, then the, the fluid will either wander into these uh, interfaces between the acetabulum, acetabulum and, the, and the socket, or it'll wander into the space between the, the stem and the shaft. And then that's when you get all the bus bubbles, okay? And then you end up with holes as big as this. This cave was caused by water over millennia. In your hip, it just takes yeah, maybe 10 years, okay? Um, so we also have to think about the shape of our implants. Um, and this is an article by uh, uh, Huss and Burdenshot. And they talk about a forced closed implant, which is basically uh, your cemented stems which are polished and tapered, and, and shape closed, which is most of your uh, cementless implants and a certain number of your cemented implants that uh, have, have a sort of shape uh, fit. Um, so if you are looking at these polished tapered stems, when you apply a load across them, which is axial, this creates hoop stresses and it forces the cement along the uh, length of the bone, uh, uh, cement interface into the bone. Uh, and if you have any uh, irregularities on that surface, then there's more uh, instability because micromotion applies. Uh, when you look at uh, finite element analysis of these things, a very polished one is stable, a very, very rough one is stable, uh, but not so. Uh, and in between, the, the sort of semi-rough ones are the ones that seem to have the, uh, the, 
the greatest amounts of stresses at, at the cement interface. So Ross Crawford uh, did his investigation. I think this was in Exeter that he did this. Uh, and uh, he, he looked at, he created this model, a fluid pressure model, uh, where the cement is in yellow or orange. The stem is inserted into the cement. And there's a clamp that closes the whole thing as a sealed unit. And then you apply fluid pressure to the proximal end of that uh, bone cement interface. And you have a collection area in which you're looking at collection of fluid coming out at the bottom. Um, and you can see how much how, or how fast the methylene blue dye that's in the pressurized fluid actually penetrates the cement. Okay, so what he found was that polystapered stems resist this effect much more than rough tapers. Um, and it may be due to the inability of cement to fill the gaps in the asperities. Okay. Um, and also probably to a certain level, uh, it may have a lot to do with uh, pressurization uh, as you go through life or as you go through time. Um, so if you look at a cylindrical one, the rough one and the polished one, you can see there's a very big difference between the mean penetration. If you look at tapered stem, again, the same difference, right? And you can pretty much say that uh, if it's rough, very rough, three micrometers, uh, your mean flow is very high. So here's a picture from uh, 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 the JVGS that shows you the difference between a satin stem and a rough stem in terms of just penetration of water into that interface between uh, the cement and the implant. And you can imagine that if there's, for any reason, there's a defect in the cement mantle, if there's a crack in the cement mantle, then that pressure is going to be transmitted directly to the uh, uh, cement bone interface, and therefore you're going to get all those bubbles, like that one. Uh, so the final principle is that cement the body temperature exhibits creep. There is no bond between taper and cement. This is what the uh, Exeter group always have said. Uh, there should be a complete cement mantle at one point to prevent transmission of hydrostatic pressures, but you don't have to have a, a complete cement mantle all the way around. Let me tell you, in my practice, I have, I have some pretty challenging hips. And it, it, in many cases, with periprosthetic fractures, we just cannot have a complete uh, cement mantle uh, all the way around. And, and you, you think that these implants fail, but actually they don't because we have enough proximally to keep these implants stable. So in summary, there are two technologies in cemented total hip replacement, reported as cemented stems in registries. And you really need to know the difference between this. You have to look at individual implants and know what they're about before you actually make some conclusions about cemented stems. Polished tapers and cemented stems are better, but this may not be reflected in registries. When I was training, I was told that the enemy of good is better. Honestly, I, I didn't understand it at the time. You know? But you know, with the wisdom of hindsight, um, I believe that this is probably more true. Like striving to be better, off we mar what's well. In other words, better is maybe not what it is. Maybe it's like when you try to make things better, you're more likely to make it worse. And have you stuck to, to simple, simple changes at the beginning, we would maybe have done much better than we are doing now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David. That was an excellent, uh, you know, analysis of the evolution of this cemented stems and uh, um, and the controversies around it. Uh, so uh, we have uh, now a couple of minutes for discussion. Uh, would you get some questions from the chat box? And uh, uh, my my first question uh, about uh, Peter. What is your opinion about uh, Professor Chun's lecture about? Uh, are the all cemented stems uh, same? Well, well I, I mean, clearly they're not. I mean, as it, I mean, there's two issues, aren't there? There's how hips developed over time, and um, so it, it became trendy to make some some stems mat. I know there were there were also mechanical reasons to want to try that about work hardening the surface, etc. Um, I mean, if you look at where we are now. Mm -hmm as in the different sorts yeah. of hips available. I mean, there's some quite interesting, the, the, there is the difference between the sort of tapered polished, polished stem as opposed to the, uh, the sort of the, 
the, the, the beam approach, but they are different. I, I, I do think as well, the, the STEM isn't passive in terms of the technique. And I, I think John Timperley with his thumb sort of demonstrates, obviously if you put your thumb as you introduce the, the um, implants, you um, get increased pressures. But actually, if you look at, say, a big charnel, an extra heavy charnel, you've got massive cement pressures when you put a big fat stem down, which was filling most of the femur. And when people then, say, went on to the elite stem, which was much narrower, much more pointed, you didn't get the same pressurization as the stem was introduced. And I, I think there's lots of evidence with that sort of variability as well. The actual introduction of the stem causes pressurization. So I think there's lots of factors about why stems have different results. Some have to do with the function of the stem when they're actually implanted, but also it's to do with the effect, if we're talking about cemented stems, the, the effect the shape and design and size of the stem has on the cement, uh, cement pressurization. But, but, but the data is there to be looked at in the registries worldwide and, the, and there are some differences and hopefully we've learned some, some lessons really. I mean, it's quite funny when you talk about cemented. I used to like Mike Robleski's comment. So if someone never said to Mike, uncemented, he'd say, well, you told me what it's not, but what is it? And, that, and I think that's quite an interesting, uh, an interesting point. Thank you. John has something to tell. Yeah, John. I, I agree. I mean, you can't lump all cemented stems together just as you can't lump all uncemented stems together. I mean, that debate, I think, has gone. I mean, and there are, and there's a big difference in, in, um, between composite beam stems and taper slip stems. And there are some composite beam stems which seem to have reasonable results. I think the really big difference is that the collars polished taper type stems are extremely forgiving. So we're trying to do the very best cementing technique positive, but, uh, possible. But if you look at the regist registry results around the world, all of the stems that have a polished surface and in function that way are doing well. So I think it's a much more forgiving stem to use uh, than a composite beam stem. Uh, and the, the technique is probably not quite so important. I don't know whether the others will agree with that. Okay. The, the, there are some basic questions I from agree. Uh, YouTube. Um, uh, question from Dr. Sandeep Pradhan. Do you use hydrogen peroxide during canal preparation, uh, Bodo? Do you use hydrogen peroxide? I think probably it's banned in... Uh, you have to uh, okay, I think. Yeah. Yes, no, I, I use hydrogen peroxide. Of course, that was the teaching and writing. And I think it goes back to the problem of preventing um, blow, blow out of uh, materials into the, into the body. I don't use power lavage or pulse lavage in, um, in the hip. I don't use it in knees either. I use syringe technique, packing technique, and I use hydrogen peroxide, and I get a dry bone bed with that. That's part of it. The problem is, of course, if you use hydrogen peroxide in the canal and pressurize it, that is the effect of getting shooting off microembolisms into the lung. I wouldn't do that. The problem of the cement goes back to technique as well and handling. The best advice to give is probably know your cement. I've seen some of the questions of what temperature and all that stuff. You've got to know your cement. You need to understand at what time it is cured. My advice is don't go early, go a little bit later because then you release less monomer into the system, but also you reduce the risk of pushing more fluid into the system. Hydrogen peroxide has worked well in our hospital. Very occasionally you get to see it, that patients drop and it's typically in femoral neck fractures, but not in typically in arthroplasty patients. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what about Matthew? Or what is the exeter philosophy of using hydrogen peroxide? Matthew is there? Yes, hi. No, so we, unfortunately, I mean, I know um, we've just heard that uh, at Rising they're using it, but the, the Medical and Health Regulation Authority in the UK advised that they should not be used uh, following a, an amputee patient who got an, an air embolism from packs that were put in his wound was soaked in hydrogen peroxide. So they issued a, a um, alert and our hospital's governance committee said that we have to follow the MHRA guidance. Um, and so we don't use hydrogen peroxide anymore. We just use saline. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Patnaik is asking, what's the optimum temperature you set in your theater to the best cement uh, curing? Uh, I've just answered that, sorry, on, on yeah. the chat. But okay. the, the, the answer is 25 degrees. And we, it's not the temperature of the room. We have a little cabinet that looks like a, a small camping fridge. Um, and that is commercially available and, and it's set at 25 degrees. 
that's for simplex. I wouldn't warm Palacos to 25 degrees. I think otherwise you might run out of time. Um, I think in India, a lot of hospitals, you'd have to call out a cement cooling device to get to 25 degrees. Um, yeah. But that's, that's the temperature we have it at. And that's purely to, inc but the other thing is um, warm, putting warm saline around, the, soaking the stem in warm saline, particularly hemiarthroplasty is when you just want the quickest possible operation for the patient. And if you, if you put pour warm saline into a kidney dish, put the stem in the kidney dish whilst you're just preparing the canal, and then that will make the cement set more quickly. Do you use, uh, you know, um, simplex cement for both the cup and the stem? So uh, John uses Palacos, I use simplex. Uh, clearly one is far better than the other. Okay. Um, but no, so I don't think, to, the answer to that really is I don't think it matters which cement you use. I just think it matters that you're familiar and comfortable with the brand that you do use. Correct. That requires the maturity of handling the, that particular cement. Uh, I think in writing turn, uh, using still CMW2 for the cup or uh, and uh, CMW1 for the stem. Yeah. 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 And, yes. so what we use actually, fast setting cement on the femur, on the acetabulum and normal setting cement in the gun for the femur, just to give you a bit more working time. The fast setting cement, I think, works well enough. My room temperature is set to 20 degrees just to be able to judge at what point the cement sets the Fast setting cement gives me about 60 seconds working time. That's normally enough for the acetabulum. On the femur, you get a bit more, but actually I expect cement to set within the 10 minute range. I wouldn't want to wait much longer. For me, actually, this, this is actually the ideal cement, but it, Shabon, it goes back to what we've done, get the feel into your fingers. And I think in the end, actually, when we look at all expertise that we have combined in this webinar, it's in everyone's hands that it works well because you've got it in your hands. And a lot of things we want to write down in textbooks, but you can't. In the end, the master actually is what he has on the fingertips. We can all cook a, a cake by the same recipe and the outcome will be different depending on what we have in fingertips. And I think that's where it boils down to. Thank you. That, that's what uh, they tell that cement is technically more difficult to do than cementless ones uh, because you have to have the maturity of uh, handling the cement. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Dhanashekhar Raja, okay, um, to Dr. Chun, that uh, is there a major difference between stem design comparing Caucasians and Asian femurs? If you could answer uh, actually, that for the benefit hi, of... Hi, Dhanashekhar Raja. I hope you're keeping well. Um, actually, I've already answered it. Basically, in both the Exeter series and the C-stem series, there is an Asiatic version. And what we found was that the... The, the Badari taper is very much, uh, ends very much more proximally uh, and, and the offsets are a little bit shorter than the Caucasian uh, population because our, our people are basically shorter. Uh, we tend to find that the men, the, the, in particular in Malaysia, the men have this a weird combination of, they have offsets that are uh, the similar to Caucasians, but have very proximal uh, uh, endpoints of the medullary taper. And so you have to put short stems in these people with long offsets. And, and so, so with the Exeter series, uh, you, you, this will be your revision steps. And that's what we tend to use. Okay, thank you. And there was a question from the chat box. Which kind of bone graft do you use for impacts and grafting? Uh, Peter, would you like to take that? Yeah. Well, for impaction grafting, we use morselized bone graft. We we use it from, we have an internal bone bank. In fact, Bodo, you should ask Bodo more. He, he runs our uh, runs oh, runs yeah. the our bone bank. Um, but yes, we use morselized um, bone that's been donated by other patients that have had their hip, primary hips done before. Is it the fresh frozen or freeze-dried graft, Bodo? Would you Bodo, speak. You talk, Bodo. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not fast enough on these buttons. I do old fashioned and it doesn't work well with the buttons. No, we actually, this, this fresh frozen bone is the best material available. When you go back historically, and again, of course, we go back to the 1990s with freeze dried, that material hadn't done particularly well. Fresh frozen works well. My suggestion is get rid of all the gums around it. The bone is taken immediately at the point at the resection actually into the box and then stored in the freezer at minus 80. That allows us to keep it for five years. It's a very efficient way of running it. In a hospital that does help mainly hip replacements, we put about three to 400 femoral heads into the box every year. 
It allows us to do our work and even pass it over to other people. Fresh frozen, don't even need to thaw it when you prepare it. I hand nibble the stuff, gives you a regular shape. Uh, the Nine Nation group will support that. They've got the registrar doing it for themselves. And then wash it in warm saline, because of course that gets rid of the bone and fat marrow. A very good way and a very efficient way to prepare a bone graft. Bodo, what about the disease transmission, you know, in the fresh frozen, the chance of, uh, you know, if the patient is in the window period of uh, hepatitis or um, so is HIV? Serious, there is a, a very a, absolutely appropriate to ask that question, Shabran. Uh, uh, the, these patients are screened superbly well, much more than the patients coming in for theatre, for surgery. They will go through all the testing regime these days, including Corona, West Nile virus and everything else, travel history, everything else is documented. It's about nine pages or so. And I signed that off at the end of it before it's released for transplantation. It needs to be done very, very thoroughly. It's done according to European standards. That's the human history trans authorities in London that control that. And we're licensed and regulated for it. You can't just do it off the cuff. It must be regulated. It's quite an intensive business to prepare it from preoperative to explain to the patient, get the consent into the freezer and then back into the other patient. And the documentation is kept for 30 years. So the process around the bone is quite laborious. But using bone is a fantastic tool to make good. And as Peter says, to restore a revision looking like a primary, a very appropriate comment. What about John? Uh, do you use fresh frozen grafts as well? Yes, we have a bone bank, an internal bone bank, like they do in Risington. Uh, the one other point I would make is that um, we also wash it when we prepared it and usually make it by hand. You want eight to 10 millimeter size in the acetabulum. If you're doing it in the femur distally, you need smaller chips than that, which we do use a mill for. But once we made the chips, we wash them with pressurized lavage again. We're big believers in lavage. Uh, and we use a warm lavage. And you know the um, prostatic chippings trays that have a mesh? We actually lavage using that. So it really cleans it out well. And there's some evidence from work done in Nijmegen and others that mechanically it's much better once you've washed them in that way uh, to get the bits together again. And it takes away all the antigenic material from the, from the, from the previous host. Uh, so we wash it with, uh, in that way. But I think fresh frozen is the best, without question. Do, do you add any bone substitutes to the bone? Uh, that's another question from Dr. J. S. R. I can answer. I'm oh, sorry. Hold on. I've been playing around actually with um, demineralized bone graft and I still use it. I've, I've got experiences actually in juvenile bone cysts, but also in fracture healing, it works really well, but it's superbly expensive. The other problem that you have actually, I wouldn't use any artificial hard bone graft substitute that doesn't work particularly well. If you want to bulk out the bone graft itself, to me, gold standard is still fresh frozen bone. If you want to bulk it out, I would suggest use demineralized bone. I would not use anything like coralline or bovine. I've got the whole series of in drawers actually to show it. Handling characteristics are not right and it won't ever quite incorporate. Demineralized bone, yes, by all means do. I will use that for osteotomies or repeat osteotomies when I'm not quite sure how well they will heal. I've used it in peripatetic fractures with very, very good results, um, but principally to me, it's fresh frozen bone. Now I think actually, and John, it's, I'm pretty sure it's a question of technique. I'm pretty sure I can demonstrate clean bone even just with my hand washing technique. Only by getting very strong fins to pressurize it well. No, no, stirring, not mixing, like James Bond, the martini technique. Got to show you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Bodo. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Vijay Bose. Uh, uh, can the folks from Exeter and Wrightington comment on the trend of cemented stems in the same shape as uncemented, like coral and polar? Um, I don't think it matters what shape your stem is if it's well proven on multiple national registries with long term outcomes. I think that's the deciding factor that decides whether a stem works well or, or not. So I, I think the decision as to what stem you use, as, as, as we heard from, from David, is that it needs to be a well proven design and not something that's designed by a company to be a me too marketing product. Matt, do you have stems which uh, uh, are good? as same as uncemented and same as cemented? Uh, I don't have a stem that's as good as an uncemented. I have a stem that's better than an uncemented. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, we don't have, uh, they are available, but uh, there aren't studies behind them and such a great ones. Well, I mean, if you look at the UK registry, that's why hybrid is so popular. 
the, the, the results of the uncemented stems is superior than, than the results of the, the cemented stems. What? You Sorry, it's not the other, other way around, other way around. There's too many knots, too many knots in that sentence. <laughs> oh, would you like to make a comment here? Actually, the registries lie in this case. Why this is, yeah. You know, your, your cups are not doing well. Because you, had, you go all the way back, people were using 22 heads, low friction, on not very good poly. And that was fine. No problem at all. Lasted a long time. Then they started to increase the size of the head and ended up with all kinds of problems because you got, got frictional torque, you got wear, your, your poly wasn't standing up to the stress. And then they introduced two things, two things. Right? They introduced a, a, a metal backing and then they introduced also much better poly. And actually what's made the difference is the much better poly. It, it isn't the metal backing. And when you look at this new series of hips that are going to come out with this new cross, highly crossing polys, they're going to do just as well. So you don't really need to use a metal back and you don't really need to go to madness. And certainly in Asia, you're dealing with problems that you, you just all showed. Patients, you know, 95% or 90% of patients in Japan having total hips are having them because they've got acetabular dysplasia. You can't really fit in a, a metal back socket into those things without a lot of trouble. I think the question what Vijay asked was about these bigger stems, which are uh, uncemented and the same versions available. For, it's, I think, the French paradox which comes in here. Uh, the last stems uh, functioning equally well, uh, cemented or uncemented. Actually, the French paradox is answered by my lecture simply because they're po highly polished tapered stems. And, and, and so you don't really need much of a cement metal to, you know, to, to succeed. Yeah. Uh, John, you have to. You wanted to tell something. Well, uh, this d discussion about um, types of stem and designs of stem really takes me back a bit because we've got stems now with 100% survivorship at 20 years. I mean, what problem are we trying to address, gentlemen? I mean, there's plenty of evidence that if you use a college polished tapered stem, particularly in the elderly, the survivorship is, is huge and it's safe to use. And to try out new stems, I think this is the reason that you'll find implant companies going to robots and things, because they can't bring new stems to the, to the market. And to prove that a stem is better than what's on, existing on the market is almost impossible. So I would say, look at the registries and, and you'll soon come away using a, a well-established uh, cemented stem, as, as Matthew said. Thank you. Oh, we'll take two more questions only before we move on to the cases. Uh, Dr. Um, Nirnal Sarma is asking that, uh, uh, Peter and Bodo, your opinion on sandwich technique for acetabular grafting in revision total hip. Peter, would you like to tell that? I don't, I don't understand what sandwich technique, what, what do you yeah, mean by that? Yeah, yeah. Can I come in? Can I come in, sorry? I think Dr. Mirnal is, going, is talking about the sandwich technique that we had presented in WS last year. It was a virtual presentation. Uh, actually, the paper is ready. The only thing remaining is the uh, uh, the lab testing of these techniques. What we actually do is we, um, in the acetabular defect, we use intervening layer of you know, injectable bone graft substitute between the two allograft layers. So as to unitize the bone graft with this uh, bone graft substitute. So we have named this sandwich technique. It has not come in the literature except being presented in WS last year. Please, you have to wait for some time because, because of COVID and these all things. Our IIT guys, all these three people were into this, got COVID and they are isolated at home. So we are waiting for the lab test. Okay, come thank you. Us. Thank you, uh, Deepak. Uh, last question, the cement removal and revisions. Oscar are just chipping it away. Peter, chipping it away. That's better. Any, any, anything against Oscar? Yeah, I, I worry about Oscar. I think it's a bit like having, it's a, it, the, the rather, if you chip it away, I think you, it, it breaks cleanly away from the, the bone. If you're using Oscar, I think it's a bit like having a hot knife and butter on top of toast. I think you just sort of smear the, um, the, the, the molten cement back into the bone. I think it's more difficult to clear. So, so I personally, I'm, I'm not a, the, the only time I like Oscar, is if you have a sort of a mul some of the old multiple revision cases where you've got some blind blind entries because someone's used a cement drill in the past just to try to find your set find your way to the to the bottom to find the middle 
but but I, I'm I just like to sit there and spend hours chipping away and annoy all my theatre staff. But yeah. thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, John, quickly, any preference? Uh, sorry, I was just answering Rakesh on the uh, on the uh, on the chat there. What was the question again? No, uh, the, uh, what's an how to take out your cement? Uh, it's ah, well, I would start. I would start from the premise of why are you cementing, removing the cement in the first place? Because if you use a colorless polished tapered stem as we've been describing, the aseptic loosening rates are minuscule. And so most of the revisions we're doing these days are for problems other than femoral, femoral fixation, problems on the socket side or, or very precise fracture, something like that, in which case you often don't need to use a cement. So by far the most we do in terms of revision on the femoral side is in cement revision where you basically you have a well-fixed cement mantle, you create a hole in that cement mantle uh, to put a, to re-cement into the existing cement mantle another stem. So that's by far the most we do. Uh, uh, if you are having to remove the cement, for instance, if there is infection or something like that, then I would use a combination of mechanical and where there's a danger of perforating or further down the canal, I would use uh, Oscar. So I'd use a combination of both. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We are really running short of time. Over to Smarajit to invite for the case presentation. We'll have quick case presentations, a couple of cases. Sure. Uh, so we'll go to the case discussions and uh, presentations and uh, subsequently discussions. We'll, we'll, we'll stick on to the time. It's for five minutes of presentation and uh, five minutes for discussion. So let us start with uh, inviting uh, Dr. Katie Rajshekhar. Uh, his case is on a cemented rim fit cup. So I invite uh, Dr. Rashekar to unmute himself and uh, uh, then uh, come to the full screen and present his case. Full screen. Can, can you see that? Yes. Very much. Uh, thank we are you. able to hear you. Uh, IIA and Dr. Uh, Montizar and uh, Dr. Samajat for giving me an opportunity to speak on this particular topic. So we are all know that uh, cemented heap is uh, gold standard since the last 40 years and giving a consistent results. But despite of this, uh, we have uh, you know aseptic loosening still the most common mode of failure in cemented THA. So the literature demonstrated that the improved results in the flange target is uh, the best version of the cemented heap in both primary and division cases. And it is a very well known gold standard. The, the striker as uh, the exeter has come with uh, the one more refined technique is called rim cutter technique. The principle of this technique is to the periphery of the acetabulum will be cut in order, in order to make the rim, the flange of the socket seats into the rim so that uh, guaranteeing the current orientation and depth of insertion of the socket and if the rim cutter has been used. The accurate position can be ensured with the rim cutter technique to navigate it with the pre desired position. So the advantage of this technique, what they think that it is improve the cement mantle quality, improve the accuracy of cement uh, centering, cup centering, reduce the incidence of uh, bottoming out, which is very common with uh, uh, some of the conventional techniques. And the opposition between the flange and the rim should be create an efficient seal and prevent the leakage of the cement coming out. Thus increasing the intra of fracture and penetration of the cement to the socket. So this is what exactly the rim cutter where uh, this, it, it removes the edges of the cup where you know this is the we can see in this picture so this is actually a pictorial diagram where this rim cut is this cut the edge of the cup where this uh, flange is sitting exactly there and so that uh, we can the final cup will be seated exactly in the same orientation wherever you want and also it prevents the bottoming out of the cup and we can get an accurate cement mantling with a uh, with this technique. And also this uh, rim cut technique when compared to the original technique of uh, flanged one, that is, uh, this is a highly crosslink poly. And this will help us to improve the wear properties 
and uh, some of the cases where if you if you are using a revision scenarios if you are concerned about 28 mm head you can use larger heads but that is little controversial and if using a high call i ali crossing poly the larger head might work i am i'm not uh, expert in this then we will speak and also that uh, this ranges from 40 to 60 mm of cup sizes are available with a difference of 2 mm the head option ranging from 22 to 40 mm head the sizing is uh, rim cup cup is uh, smaller than the final reamer the cup size should be smaller than the final reamer the largest reamer used is if it is 56 then the cup should be 54 the rim cutter is chosen to the correct size of the plant implant size that is 54 rim cutter should be used this is one of the patient where uh, we use this technique and uh, since this is a very osteoporotic bone and wide medullary canal and uh, uh, then we plan for cemented hip and this was the stabulum was prepared with the standard in, uh, technique of cemented hip and the periphery of the rim was reamed i don't have picture of that and this is the rim where they said for the cup of the same implant we use and this is the final implantation picture and uh, this is the exact stem and this is the post op x ray where we can see that uh, the position of the cup is very well uh, and maintain the position and cement thing is very good but again uh, when i read the literature uh, mr ross crawford is uh, published in 2009 saying that it is a significant improvement in cement penetration preventing the bottoming out of the cup increasing the cement band thickness in the acetabular component was found to be with the use of rim cutter rim rim cutter technique it is going to better cementation but there is another paper in 2016 where uh, they studied uh, this cups with the concern with you know the compared with a conventional poly with a flange technique they found there is a progressive radiolution lines following the implantation of the cemented rim fit cup in this they concerned this a... so what they done in 150 total lips in the in 75 they used rim cutter 75 or they used uh, flange technique and in that they found that they had there is a uh, the post operative radiolution is found in uh, all the three zones especially in uh, 84% cases when compared to the 23% of flange one in zone 2 there is a 56 percentage when compared to 0% in third one and uh, and in three zones it is almost 23% when compared to 0% with the conventional technique so there on these findings they stop using this rim cutter technique when implanting the rim fit acetabular component so revert back to the flange regular technique so the message is that the surgeon should be vigilant in performing a rim cutter or stabler component and use along with the rim cutter device because they found that progressive radiolucency with this combination technique so i want your the house opinion where these uh, uh, people are using exactor then they have been must have been used this or what is their opinion or who are this opinion yeah. on the, i want to know the discussion, discussion. yeah matthew your opinion on this please yes so like you we i mean it was developed in exo so the, the rim cutter so when it first came out and the, the biomechanical um studies were very positive so we used it uh, and then like you said um there was concerns expressed about whether there were more loose and lines behind it so we reviewed our own series um we found no statistical difference between Uh, a, a historical series that were used without the rim cutter and a historic and, and the, a series that were done with the rim cutter but we definitely saw um at least as many uh lucent lines behind the cups so we thought well it's it's there's no sign of it's a benefit other centers are expressing some concern it's an additional step it is quite a, a bulky instrument it's not that easy to use in every case and so now our teaching is we don't use it we 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 don't use it um as as a routine instrument bodo what is your comment about og cup flanges and the you know uniform flange of uh, uh, exeter cup 
Uh, I, I would stress, oh, sorry, uh, oh. just one last thing. We yeah. use a flange cup, but we don't use it so that it sits over the bone and sits on the mouth as the rim cutter intended. So we still use the flange cup. I think that's important, but we don't use it with the rim cutter so that the flange goes out and overlapping the bone. What is your head size you are using, uh, Mr. Matthew? Now, it is Routine head size we use is a 32 with cross-link poly. Yeah, 32. But I think the important thing is with cross-link poly, though, is if the two go together, the results with cross-link poly are very different than the results without cross-link poly. What about small acetabulum? You know, most of the Indian women, we find the cuff size is much less. You know, it may be around, say, 46 or 48, something like that. So okay. in those cases, you'll use 28, correct? So the smallest cross-link poly cemented cup we have on the shelf is a 48. Uh, it's not actually a 48 cup. The cup is 44 with, with two mil pods, uh, which make it 48. So um, yes, if they're smaller than that, then we drop down a head size to 28. Dr. Rajshakar, would you like to stop sharing your screen uh, while we have uh, Bodo's Bo Bo comment on that? Yeah, Bodo, your final comments? Yeah, I, I don't use power tools on the acetabulum. I think actually it just creates too much of a smooth surface, doesn't allow good for, for good incorporation. As you remember, Shubanshu, we dug everything out by hand and sharp osteotomes. You need to have well-maintained instruments, but you can craft in bone just as much as you can craft in wood without power tools. Um, I very rarely use a reamer to, and that's more, most likely in a sclerotic hard bone just to scrape the, the cartilage off. I think I would just stress you need to leave enough irregularities around it. One of the problems I see with machining and tooling is it makes it too precise and you don't get enough interdigitation. You don't want to take away the asperities and that's what the problem actually with at least rotating instruments is certainly in the acetabulum. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bodo. Can I make a comment? So yeah, yeah, I, think, I think this is a great example, though, about the, you know, the enemy of good is better. <laughs> so I think we really think about that. Just about the acetabular component, I do think you know, feet on the acetabular component are not a great idea because if the thing bottoms out and lands, obviously you'll lose all pressurization under the flange. Uh, at writing turn, so maybe eight, Nine years ago, you know, we developed the, uh, the marathon cemented socket, which is obviously a highly cross-linked poly socket that you can cement. I mean, that does go down to a 38 external millimetre diameter, so you get it quite small, and that will take that will, will obviously accommodate a 22 head. So using highly cross-linked poly, yes, you can go bigger, and, and my, own, my only acknowledgement to going slightly larger is I'll use a 28 millimetre head as opposed to a 22 with cross-link poly, but I don't like to go any bigger than 28 millimeters because I don't see what the point is really. Again, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to change too many things and you don't want to suddenly, we had lots of problems when we went big last time, I think with, with large heads and it's just not necessary. And bone is the thing you need to preserve. And I really think you need to remove as little bone as possible from the acetabulum. Yes, you need to expose cancellous bone, do multiple keyholes, maybe leave the, the subchondral bone get rid of the cartilage certainly but you don't want to be losing lots of acetabulum by reaming away and you don't want to be losing the rim either I don't think you know it, you know if you're going to have to revise later on if you've lost the rim at that point and it's loosened you've lost more bone and you want to lose as little bone as possible. Peter do you use 32 head? No not at all I use a 28 millimeter head. Peter you are uh, from anti-approach anterolateral? No, no, no. I, I, I've, I, I, I used a trochanteric approach up until 12 years ago, and I, for the last 10 years, I've, I do a posterior approach. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Let's move on to Dr. Reddy's case. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. good evening. Yeah. Greetings from Hyderabad. We are still in uh, lockdown. Um, thank you very much for uh, giving uh, the opportunity, Dr. Patnaik and uh, Dr. Mohanty. Great job. I'm going to present a simple case. Uh, I won't take much time. Um, this is a 51-year-old female. Total hip was done about two years ago. There was a dislocation post-operatively about 48 years ago. Tried uh, close reduction, could not uh, succeed, succeed, but uh, uh, did open reduction. And is complicated by post-op infection. Initially treated by antibiotics. Infection continued for six months. 
So they tried to remove the components, presented to me with a chronic discharging sinus, partly remaining component inside, and she was uh, bedridden uh, for the last uh, six months. So it's a combination of uh, infection and, of course, um, uh, DDH. This was the close-up of the X-ray. So I think this is uh, quite a while ago when I came back from UK about 2006. We I took all the components out, the brighter thoroughly, and put the cement uh, beads inside. And about uh, two months later, I took the cement bead out, beads out and did a total hip at the site, as you can see the using the femoral head as the um, corticocancellous uh, graft. Um, probably, you can go back, surgeon probably did not realize it was a dysplastic hip. That may be the reason why it was uh, dislocated. Then uh, following a month, I did uh, the other hip revision. And you can see there wasn't uh, um, any oh, allografts available those days. So I used the iliac crest, big chunk of iliac crest, screwed in. That's uh, four months uh, later. And five years follow, you can see incorporation of the graft. And uh, this is uh, 10 years follow up. You can see cement uh, gone out of the um, femur by hole. But I think uh, now I got 15 years uh, follow up of this patient and uh, doing well, um, uh, pain free, and there's no evidence of uh, recurrence of infection. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Uh, Peter, your opinion on this case? Well, I'm, obviously, you, you've managed that very well. I, I, I agree I would have done the same as in a, a two-stage revision because I was, I'd, as you have done, you've used structural graft. I, I suppose the only... Um, I mean, presumably, when you remove that cement from the femur, yeah. obviously, you've with the perforation at that point. Yes, yeah. Uh, I mean... I, I, I must be honest, I did not recognise intraoperatively it, uh, I, I recognize post-operatively, but I think uh, um, it was uh, quite stable, so um, there wasn't any problems associated with cement. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, my only comment would be, I mean, in, in terms of my philosophy of trying to make my revisions look like primaries, I mean, why did you go so long on the femur? Did you really need to go that long? No, it wasn't. <laughs> probably. <laughs> I, probably, uh, I, 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 probably wouldn't, I wouldn't go long stem now, but probably I think... Uh, um, I want, uh, I think those days probably I was uh, you know, keen to do a longer stem, so thought maybe a better option, but now I wouldn't do a long stem. But that's a good. I mean, that's my only comment. I'm not being critical. It's just. <laughs> do you think there is some still cement left uh, before the revision uh, in, the, in the femoral side that you wanted to take those cement out? And uh, in that, uh, we perforated the cortex, and uh, that's why you have to use a long stem. Yeah, probably, I think, uh, I can't remember those things, but I think uh, um, the, uh, the perforation was there. I didn't recognize perforation um, intraoperatively because uh, it was pressurizing well. Uh, there wasn't any um, signs or symptoms to say perforation. Probably I should have uh, um, seen under uh, C-arm, but I didn't. Uh, and uh, as you know, I think uh, the one of the reasons I, I should uh, tell you, because uh, those days... Uh, we had a limited stack of implants. Right. Um, so the choice was, wasn't was much. Uh, the next uh, smallest was too small, probably. So that was the reason. And it is the only implant available. As you can see, one side I've done Exeter. The primary side, other side, it was a C-stem, long C-stem, which is not available nowadays in India. Right. Dr. Chun, uh, how often do you do ETO to take out the cement? Uh... Um. Generally speaking, if it's uh, cements very far down, it's much easier if you do an extended trope osteotomy. And sometimes I even almost like bivalve the femur and take the trope header off with it as well. And, and it, it really makes your life much easier. And you know, when you put this, it, when you put these uh, trochanters back, you can just partially cement your long stem in 
and then you, you add the rest of the cement in as, as you then clap your, your, your throw canter back in place. Uh, it, it looks like perfect, they don't come loose. The thing about polystaper stems is they're so forgiving that little, little, little defects don't really turn up anywhere. They, they, like, they don't come back to haunt you, you know, that's, that's the beauty of them. But really, I would like to know what Peter K says, because I know Sani and Rod uh, wrote a paper many years ago where they did one stage revisions. And I think the Exit Boys believe the same thing as well, that, you know, one stage revisions in infected hips with cemented total hips is actually a good idea. Because, you know, you, you get pretty good results. I mean, I don't know. No, no, completely. I mean, I, I do an, I do where, where I can. I nearly, I always do a one stage revision. What I haven't got the courage of, to do, and in this particular case, because it was a dysplastic socket and it needed a bone graft to the acetabulum, I would not personally. I would not do a one stage revision for deep infection with a bone graft at the same time. That's my yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I, I know there are some, there are some series from around the world. Where, where people have done that. But no, I, I absolutely, I'm a complete believer in one stage revision for deep infection. I can bore you to death with why that is. But, it, it, but if I'm going to use bone graft, I, up to now, I've always done a two stage revision, particularly structural bone graft. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, would you like to stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Well, the next, next presenter, uh, Dr. Patnay. Uh, yeah, there is one question for Dr. Reddy. What is his weight bearing yeah. protocol? Yeah, let's, let's the, uh, invite the next. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. cemented hips. I think I asked them to weight bear straight away. There's no restriction as such because uh, they only weight bear what is comfortable to them. So I don't restrict to weight bearing. Um, even uncemented, I do. There's no restriction uh, unless there is a reason to. I mean, if a lot of uh, bo impaction bone grafting, probably I wouldn't. Uh, weight bear them, but I think cemented, straight forward cemented, there's no restriction on weight bear. Dr. Rakesh. Dr. Rakesh. Uh, is it me? Yeah, it's you. Okay. Right, so I think uh, we've had fantastic, I'm really excited. And uh, we've got uh, uh, fantastic cases also. So I'll just uh, go on. Um, I think, uh, Bodo, I agree with you that this man should have won the Nobel Prize. There was a surgeon who came really close. Uh, he was one, but I think uh, he was also a fierce fighter. And he didn't get on with a lot of others who we would have nominated. And I think that he got wrong, but otherwise he's still our hero. Uh, so I think the history of this gentleman, uh, 79 year old guy, just one thing. Am I audible and visible? Yeah. yeah. The yeah. voice. So just my, yeah, my net is not very strong. I think it's getting a bit weaker. But uh, if it is, then just let me know. I'll uh, switch off my video. Sure. So he's a diabetic who's on oral anti-diabetic drugs. Slightly poor control. Um, we are going back about uh, eight years now. So he had a, a, a bypass surgery. And after that, he's had a repeat MI. And now... When he's come for his surgery, he's got an LVF of 40%. Uh, two months ago, he's had a fall. So he comes from a slightly distant place. Uh, there he was said that you can't have this operation uh, because of this low um, uh, LVF. So he didn't uh, actually seek medical treatment, but then life became uh, very difficult. But of course, before the fall, he was uh, arthritic, but uh, independent walker, but arthritic in the knee. So that's his presentation when he's come to us. Uh, so you can see like, the neck, uh, the fracture is actually quite uh, basal in this case. Uh, and the neck's almost completely absorbed. The head itself is just a saucer left. So I think uh, if you look at what our options are, uh, majority of these patients uh, at 79 probably will get a bipolar uh, head if they are fresh. Uh, you've just heard about uh, his medical history. So you could argue that he's probably for a cemented stem. Um, I'm pretty okay with, uh, you know, cemented, but some might go for an uncemented. You could, because he's now come two months later uh, and immobility. So probably, uh, you know, you could think about a THR in him because he was an independent um, mobilizer before. Now would uncemented THR be an option? Cemented THR, hybrid or reverse hybrid? So all are options. So I think what we did for this guy was we did a cemented uh, THR for him. Now, um, the previous x-ray, which I just showed you, if I uh, go back, 
uh, what I didn't actually uh, guess very well that he actually had a quite crooked spine and he had a very scoliotic spine. And you can even see from my post-op X-ray here that the stem is uh, quite tilted. And if I just tilt the whole thing back, uh, you can just imagine how the frame has actually tilted to show you that uh, there was a spine tilt. Luckily, uh, though I was actually pretty happy on the table, but the post-op X-ray, if you just uh, go back, it does look the cup slightly vertical. Of course, I had no problem with this location. He went on pretty well. And here down the line, he actually had a slip and did this. So he's had a periprosthetic fracture. Um, you know, uh, we know that he's 79, he's now 80 years old. So he's one year down the line. The uh, cup part is functioning quite well, but now we have a polished tapered stem, which has broken through the cement mantle. So what are our options now for this case? So uh, of course we've got to do something with the stem. Do we believe this stem is well fixed? So I think uh, if this was a, uh, a Chandi stem, probably you would say it is now loose. But uh, in this case also, if you look at the way it has actually fractured, let me give you one more shot at this. So whatever you decide, whether you go for cemented or uncemented, but if you are the guy who's gonna go for uncemented stems, I always say that, you know, be prepared. You need to have a second, uh, you know, um, second cover for yourself. So keep a cemented stem as backward, mishaps do happen. So this is his, uh, another uh, view from this thing. And you can make out from this that, that stem, there's a lot of cement which has actually got lost uh, from this fracture. So uh, there are of course, uh, you know, algorithms as to how you make out the stems uh, loose or not. So at this stage, again, you are wondering what, what your options are now. So one option is he's a frail guy. Remember he's a, a very severe cardiac issues. He's had one surgery somehow managed. So we just fix it back and or if, which is reasonable enough in majority of cases, if you feel there is some sort of uh, stem which is stable, but I would say that that is more hope uh, than actually, you know, uh, and faith rather than the actual scientific basis to our argument. Or do I revise into an uncemented stem? Most of us are actually very happy revising with uncemented stems. We are not very used to doing revisions with a cemented stem. Or do I revise to a cemented stem? Uh, most of us are not used to, but, uh, you know, uh, we've been trained in uh, Bristol for actually with, with this so now we revise with a cement in cement uh, revision. And you've heard quite a few arguments now that if you have a aseptic uh, case where, uh, you know, leave the cement mantle lean. And if you want to do a quick surgery, this probably will be your quickest surgery. So what we've done here is a cement in cement revision. We have not taken out cement. We've just packed in more cement, uh, managed to cable things back. But because there was a fracture and there was some distortion in the cement, you could see that I couldn't close the fracture. I mean, there is some extrusion. Cement, but it doesn't matter. What you want is this a cardiac, serious cardiac issue? Why you want to do a quick surgery? And I think this is much, much quicker and safer than what a uncemented stem would give you. Of course, um, I don't know if uh, Doctor uh, Peter Keys will still want to do a small stem in this, but um, I think I'm pretty okay with this this stem. The only trouble with this longer stems is that you don't have too many sizes. Uh, so that's the only limiting factor. But otherwise, I think uh, it's quick and in a medically comp. These are game changers. So I think a cemented revision stem is also an option uh, when you're coming back to these cases. And it actually becomes a better option if you are in a medically compromised state. And of course, we've uh, got experiments from Rhinelander and his company that bone healing is not an issue in periprosthetic fractures treated with cemented stem. And I think this is a very message we need to give because that's an argument many people give that when you put cement, the, the fractures may not heal. But I think the fractures heal pretty well in, uh, even with cement, and that shouldn't be an argument. So I think uh, that's my case. I'll just come out. We'll be happy if there are any questions. Uh, Matthew, your comments about, uh, do you use cemented stems and periprosthetic fractures as well? So yes, yeah, we, we've published a series of, of cement in cement, um, and we found um, that it's, it's a very good technique. And I agree with everything he said. It doesn't matter if you have a little bit of escape of cement, uh, you know, Graham Gee always told me, if you see a bit of cement escaping, don't put your finger over, because if you put your finger there, that's a valve, and then the pressure will rise and it will come out somewhere else. And so just keep your hands away and then scrape it away at the end. And then you'll have one or two little spots where cement's got through, but the rest. But you do need to have a, re a reducible tube. You, need, you know, you can't have a, a very fragmented fracture with great big gaps everywhere. You need a reducible tube. But a lot of these fractures, pericost fra fractures in elderly patients, they're, they're long spirals with maybe two or three large fragments, very frequently two or three large fragments. And you often find, 
because you haven't removed all cement, they're like, like a child's jigsaw, you know, big pieces and they lock together well. If you try and remove all the cement and then try and reduce the tube, it's, it's like an adult jigsaw and it's almost impossible and you can't find that little piece with the green bit in the corner, you know. Um, and so I, I, I think cement in cement for peripatetic revision is a very useful technique to have amongst the choice of techniques, not the only technique, but it's one of the ones you should have in your, your skill set. But, but do you have thin, long stems available to do cement? I wish, cement? I, uh, so I wish that we had thinner stems in long sizes. I think, you know, when they were first introduced, they were primarily designed for very cavitatory femurs with impaction grafting where there's plenty of space. Um, the, the 205 stems are a little bit slimmer, but I agree with you. Um, you know, it's a cemented product from an American manufacturer. It's not the top of their list of products to develop, I think is the truth to be known. And I would prefer that they had some slimmer stems, long stems. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, let's move on to the next case. There are certain questions on the chat box, I think, for Professor Chun. We can answer that. Uh, Dr. Deepak, in the meantime, can screen share. Dr. Yeah. Deepak. Yeah. Is it visible? Yeah. 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 Good. 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 Yes. Good. Good. Okay. So I start. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is a case I am um, going to discuss uh, periprosthetic femoral laces in a young female. A young male, sorry. There was a case, uh, he's a 35 year old known case of ankylosis. He underwent sequential totally part of the right side was operated in 2000 and the left side in 2017. He presented us with gradual onset pain in right thigh since last one and a half years. The pain was increasing in intensity for last three months. Radiologically, you can see the radiolucency around the uh, right femoral prosthesis, which is quite obvious. We investigated him to rule out the infection. ESR was 23, CRP was 0.4. We also did a bone scan, bone scan to root out um, infection. Also, we expected the joint because we wanted to be doubly sure so that there is no any infection. Bone scan shows, uh, showed uh, aseptic loosening where the aspiration showed no growth till five days. So what is the plan of treatment in this case? Considering the age of the patient, the type of the bone defect and the remaining bone stuck. We have our own rationale that if a patient is likely to require additional reconstructive procedures or revision in future, we must preserve or augment the bone stuck. He's 35 years old one. Accordingly, we plan for impaction allograft of the femur. Uh, um, in the technique, uh, we threaded a wire, we uh, distal plug with a uh, mounted wire so as to centralize the neomedullary canal. These are the special instruments shaped for bone impaction. And the, what we do, was, uh, do regularly was uh, impact the smaller bone chips in the distal part and the larger chips in the proximal part. Nowadays, we are mixing the both and impacting in the proximal part. These are the temps for which, um, uh, um, uh, which uh, uh, are used before the cementation for the uh, stem that we have um, uh, used. We use the CTG2 stem in this case. This is the immediate post-operative x-ray. This is the six months follow-up. You can see some radiolucencies around the component here. This is the one year follow-up and this is the two years follow-up. So the indication for impaction allografting of fever, if patients are likely to require an additional reconstructive procedure in their lifetime in uh, present in a revision scenario with a spacious intermedullary canal, with femoral defect, not having four to six centimeter of cortical bone distally to provide a fit for a revision stem, 
or when i stem from an ipsilateral totally arthroplasty prevents femoral component revision with a long revision implant this would be an ideal case for a impacts and allografting of a femur however the prerequisite prerequisite is a continuous femoral tip which is in fact confirmed intraoperatively we need a minimal cancellous bone present after removal of the stem and medically the patient should be stable enough to tolerate a slightly longer operation the literature i have shown survivors right between 80 to 100% with an average of 95% 90.5% are uh, at and follow up average follow up of 11 years nevertheless the rate of femoral fracture has also been reported up to 9% with an average of 5.4% there are certain complications with this technique the major are the subsidence and the fracture apart from the disease transmission the subsidence may Um, lead to dislocation, thigh pain, aseptic lesion, and risk of early failure. The fracture may be due to the quali bone quality and thin cortical support. And the most common site of fractures are the areas of cortical restriction just distal to the tip. So there, the certain tips for a successful outcome are the morphology of the cement profile, that is, its penetration into the graft and the cement industrial contact. the cases where the cement profile did not reach the endoscopium resulted in greater subsidence than those with cement endoscopium contact so we use a low viscosity cement with a small diameter annular while cementing the in the neo medullary cavity graft density is an, uh, is, uh, is an important factor achieving a dense graft bed during impacts and is often considered essential for initial system stability and the shear within the allograft bed so we use in our days a well graded mix of particulate that has a wide range of particle sizes to allow maximum pack density we rinse the graft before use and using a optimum impacts and force for the uh, dense grafting to prevent the longitudinal cement um, fracture and hence the subsidence a 2 mm region of um, pure cement is required around the uh, stem and to prevent the slippage of endoscopium surface uh, we have to optimize the cement profile penetration into the graft bed and we have written a chapter on the technique of impacts and allograft in revision ephemer in the mastering orthopedic techniques now the floor is open for questions Just thank question. you uh, bodo what is your comments about any uh, dr bodo are you happy with this x-ray two years Mother Nature is wonderful, isn't it? Restores bone and makes it look, you know, you've gone back to a short stem again, beautifully restored. You got something. And the next thing to do is observe what Mother Nature does with it, with, with the femur. The cortex will build thing thicker again over the years to come. <coughs> so you have indeed created a scenario where in the future this patient has another go at it. But I bet actually that stem will stay in for another twenty years. Okay, thank you. Uh, Uh, Peter, your comments about this impacts on grafting here? I think it's brilliant, fantastic. You've made your revision look like a primary. You've gone short, and I think it's absolutely the way to go. Okay, what's the weight bearing protocol after impacts on grafting? Is it the same? Not immediate weight bearing? Oh no. What, I, so, so after primary hip replacement, obviously, I, without bone grafting, you know, full weight bearing. I do restricted weight bearing for twelve weeks, on average. You know, if it's, if it's an absolutely enormous, you know, if you've done a massive impaction grafting or you've got a big structural graft, say in the acetabulum, with impaction grafting as well, I might go for even a little bit longer than three months, but usually twelve weeks. Okay, thank you, thank you, Deepak. Could you stop sharing your screen? We can go to the last case, uh, Dr. Kanan. Dr. Kanai. Dr. Kalai. Yes. Yeah. So, late good evening to everyone, the team Indian Arthroplasty Association, and my mentors. Thanks for the opportunity. Here, we are discussing uh, one of the cement in cement femoral revision. As this is a era of uh, revision, we want one more choice. to be kept in mind whenever we are doing a revision cases so uh, here by our hri selection criteria for doing a cement in cement revision of femoral component make sure that there is no signs of any periprosthetic joint infection clinically no sinus no impending sinus or no obvious discharge and in the blood look for the normal esr 
and the CRP and uh, no signs of radiological loosening of the femoral component that can be seen with the help of serial x-ray looking for no signs of subsidence and no radiological loose lines. Uh, nowadays, even the patients come sometimes with the bone scan or the PET scan to have an idea of loosening of either the femoral component or acetabular component or both the components. So our aim is mainly whenever we do a primary or revision, it is a bone preservation, less morbidity, less mortality and early recovery. And it's been indicated only while doing the aseptic revision. So here by a 60 year old male, primary THO was done at the age of 29 years and the age in the year 1989. And he underwent the first revision, total hip replacement in 2002 at the age of 42. He had the cemented, both the times the cemented THO was been done. And right now he had a groin pain and uh, he was presenting with a limping almost for the three months. He attended us in uh, la in uh, uh, large, last March 2020. And uh, he has no hypertension, diabetes, or, or, or bronchial asthma. And uh, the plan was to do a revision hip replacement and uh, aseptic one component revision. So while to rule out the infection, clinically the silent scar and the blood parameters were normal. And uh, whenever those blood parameters are normal, we don't do generally the puncture cleaning. So the revision of the acetabular component is, uh, is necessary because it's been like proven like yes, eccentrically placed head and uh, loose acetabular shed and lysis in all the three zones. And our plan was to go for an uncemented uh, cup using the jumbo press fit cup concept. Uh, coming to the femoral component, here the femoral component need to be revised because the model are, the new uncemented acetabular cup won't be able to accommodate the old Charlie head. Man, and here, coming to the femoral side, there is no subsidence. There is no obvious signs of loosening in any of the groin zones. And uh, since there was no space between the greater trochanter and the cup, the, 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 the dislocation is going to be tough. So here we had a plan A and plan B. Plan A was to have a cement in cement revision femoral stem to, to cut short the morbidity. And uh, plan B, if the stem was not able to come out to do a ETO, to remove the cement mantle and go for a distal fitting and cemented stem or a cemented stem. So here comes the caveat. He is uh, had underwent he met with a road traffic accident and uh, he, by five years before he became amputee on the right side. So this time we made sure that we create a less morbidity on the uh, left side while doing the revision stem. And uh, we wanted to do the cement in cement in the femoral aspect and uh, the same plan of doing an uncemented cup on the astroblast side. And we wanted to have the option of cemented in cement, even in this scenario. So instead of a, a extended trochanteric osteotomy, we plan for a sliding osteotomy where the abductors, GT, and the vastus lateralis abductor apparatus has been protected in a uh, similar way, in a separate way. And uh, the once you do the sliding osteotomy and uh, all the, the stem came out easily, smooth stem, and uh, the osteoblast shell was removed and prepared for a uncemented cup. And uh, a jumbo cup concept pre adapt was used. Cement in cement femur revision was used and ceramic head was used. And the sliding osteotomy site was fixed to the SSY circulate system. And the immediate post op x ray was looking good. And even during the revision, we used to send for the culture for uh, 45 days and uh, proven it was like no signs of any growth. And this is a one year follow up and is a walking video and he's been doing good. And the second case is like a 48 year old male, diabetes and hypertension. He underwent uh, recently a left bipolar in 2020. And he had his uh, cemented total hip replacement at the age of uh, 49 in 96. And after 25 years, he had a painful right hip for the last four months, uh, affecting his day-to-day -day activities. And he attended us in recent March 21. And we planned for a aseptic revision as his ESR CRP was normal. And there is, was no signs of any femoral loosening. A stabler side, eccentrically placed a femoral head indicative of extensive polyreaction, extensive ostabular bone loss, and Paproski classification was around three by. We planned for a jumbo cup concept, otherwise an augment and downsizing cup concept. In the femoral side, we know the age, we are taking in respect of the age, we wanted to, to less the operative time and also less morbidity. And since there was no signs of any aseptic loosening in the femoral side and no infection, we went on with uh, cement in cement femoral uh, revision. This is the immediate post-op x-ray after that. 
and uh, uh, one more x-ray one more patient in uh, he underwent a thr at the age of uh, 37 and he attended in 2013 at the age of uh, 70 and taking account of his uh, old age we wanted to create a less morbidity so this time we create we changed only the cup and we in the cement side already he underwent a periprosthetic fracture so this time we did a cement in cement and protected the x-ray and this another one example he underwent at 26, at the age of 26, and uh, went to a cemented THR. And uh, at the 46, he came for a, for, she came for a revision. And whenever we do uh, revision in such young age, we have to concentrate on the bone preservation. So the cup was a TM shell on the astablar side. And in the femur side, we did a smooth polish and cement in cement, and an excellent follow-up of seven years. And whenever we do, we look for the smooth, uh, small smooth polish stem, small offset, especially exeter. And good cementation is the key. Cement restrictor and cement can are important. And we use simplex cement. And this one more article to have an idea of the to look for the loosening around the femoral stem. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kalai. That was a excellent series of cases. I think we are way behind the schedule. Just uh, one final comment from uh, Dr. Chun about these cases. Uh, David, you are there. Kind of like it's yeah, it's using cement, and it's always a good idea. And uh, if you need to graft it, it's a good idea. But yeah, if you don't want to graft it, it's okay. It's, uh, I think that the cases where You've had to, I've had to revise the case because we've not had enough bone graft to cover it. We've actually not used uh, any bone graft. And it, success has been there, but I, my feeling is that uh, these cases don't do as well as those where we've used bone graft. So if you're going to do a big revision, then using the bone graft is an idea. Um, I agree uh, with Peter K that going short is, is, is good if you can, but it's not always that you can. If you're going to, you know, and um, I will also say that uh, where it comes to uh, reinforcing bone, you can reinforce it in many ways. Um, in the first series of our patients who we revised uh, with uh, uh, massive cortical allografts, we just uh, we covered the bone defect with massive cortical allografts. We left the nat native bone in place and then we put extra tibial cortical allografts on top and then we did impaction grafting and cemented it in. And you, you can imagine that to put those implants in, we would have to strip everything off the bone, all the soft tissue envelope, all the muscles are gone. We basically devascularized the bone, okay? But you know, they all united, they all healed, not one failed. It's amazing. Then we had one case, I, I, I don't know if any of the Exeter group uh, still do this, but you know, the, the Exeter actually comes with a, with a mesh that looks like a proximal femur. You can wrap it around and you can, it, like, like, like there's almost like no proximal femur or it's completely mush. You, you can just put this thing around it and then you impaction graft into it and it seems to be okay. It seems to take, it's a quite amazing thing actually. So a blood supply isn't always what you need. Uh, that's my impression. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Just vote to encourage growth. Uh, I think we have to close down the session before I close down any, any comment? From just, any? just one thing. Uh, I want to ask Professor Peter K, uh, which of these uh, three acetabulums you would have still preferred to do a cemented uh, revision? In the last three cases which you saw, which of the acetabulums you would have still preferred to do a cemented uh, acetabulum? So I think, well, so in terms of those presentations, I'm completely yeah. supportive of what was done on the femoral side, the in cement revision, I think was, was I would do that, that was good. I must admit for the acetabular, I would have bone grafted all three of those. I, would, I, I, I don't like using a large jumbo uncemented socket, I think. Uh, and I have to say that I think bone graft in the acetabulum works un unbelievably well with a cemented socket. I, I showed you a case in my talk where we'd use something like five femoral heads massive defect and um, it's remarkably forgiving and works so well it, it really does in the acetabulum i think peter the problem in india is that we don't really have that much access to our uh, bone, bank. bone banks bone yeah bank. so that's yeah, a very severe limiting factor here completely i, I completely understand that i mean I, i've had that discussion many times before i mean we're, we're very lucky we're very lucky that that but but i do think it's something to invest in and look at the uh, bone yeah. banking you know, particularly because you have some really young patients that you do hip replacements on, but most of those cases were so young, 
and they've got a lot a lot longer to live as well. So um, may, may, maybe as institutions, you need to get together and work out how to run but bone banks. I know it's not easy, but I, I think it's like it's like any bank. I, I always think bone is like money, you know, in in terms of hip replacement, you know, and uh, it is, yeah. and and it's you know, investment. It's an investment, so you want to make an investment bank. And bone. we have the bank manager too. <laughs> yeah. You know, Rakesh, I can tell you where else you can get bone. I know in India, just like in Malaysia, for me, we do bilateral total knee replacements. And if your if your patients are big enough, actually two total knees is equals like one one femoral head. Okay. I know, uh, David. Uh, actually, I went to Exeter, if, uh, Matt, and uh, purely to look at their bone bank. Uh, because I was very keen. I actually shifted my hospital because the previous one just wouldn't support us for bone bank. The new one said they will uh, help me with this. And since then, the COVID has come. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Uh, Dr. Patnaik, would you like to conclude, give your concluding remarks before Mark. we wind up? Uh, sir, as moderating this wonderful, uh, long awaited uh, webinar is like uh, icing on the cake for me. But I think you should have the final word about it because. Uh, it has been a great experience moderating this uh, webinar. So please have your final word. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patnaik, for moderating this session. Uh, I'm really you know, grateful to all our invited speakers, starting with Bodo, uh, for giving, uh, you know, really going back to the future from where we started in 1960s. So he given uh, you know, insight to channel his work, uh, followed by you know, Professor Peter K to talk about the that cemented hip is really coming back probably, and um, Matthew to tell us about the planning, and uh, you know, Professor uh, Timperley to talk us about the really the techniques how to do a proper cementing, and uh, followed by Dr. Pachore who spoke us about uh, that uh, about bone cement implantation syndrome and. Uh, of such tune that uh, that all cemented the hips are not same. Thank you, really great on behalf of our Indian Arthroplasty Association. I thank you uh, for devoting your time. We are running almost an hour late. The last thing to couple one announcement that uh, we are taking out a special issue on arthroplasty from Indian Journal of Orthopedics. It's a PubMed Index Journal in September of 2021. I request all of you to contribute for this and the last date is the 10th of June that uh, if you can contribute an article for this journal. Me and Dr. Amar Ranamath has been invited as the guest editors for this issue. Our next webinar will be on the third Saturday of June, that is 19th June on patellofemoral arthrosis, how far have we come? And Dr. Manu Jwadha, who is the chairman and executive director of Elite Institute of Orthopedics from Punjab will be the convener. And uh, I request all of you to attend. I thank you for attending this meeting and uh, have a nice evening. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time and waiting till the end. Shubhranshi, very good to see you again. You take care, thank everybody. You.